This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, we are all set to go. I want to welcome everyone to this meeting of November 10th, 2020. This meeting is being conducted by means of electronic participation as permitted by Section 238, 3.1 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended and the Town and Modal Procedural Bylaw 2020-42. Council Chambers will not be open to the public. This may, meeting may be viewed live starting at 7 p.m. on the 10th of November uh, on the Mono Civic Web Portal video. We want to confirm quorum and call to order. Uh, we have um, Sharon Martin, Fred Nix, and Ralph Magdalo in attendance. We are expecting John Creelman to join us, so we'll just uh, uh, welcome him when he does arrive. Notification of proceedings being uh, videoed and uh, recorded and broadcast so that the public is aware. Councillors can declare a pecuniary interest at, now, at any time throughout the meeting and can be done verbally and then also has to be sent in, in writing to the clerk. And now I will, I will read the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. We would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the town of Mona resides within the traditional territory and ancestral lands of the Tionantati, Atawandaron, Hodi, No Shoni, Anishinaabe peoples. We also acknowledge that the town of Mona resides within the treaty lands named under Treaty 18, the Narusaga Purchase of 1818. These traditional territories upon which we live and learn are steeped in rich indigenous history and traditions. It is with this statement that we declare to honor and respect the past and present connection of the indigenous peoples within this land, its waterways and resources. Thank you. And I see that uh, Deputy Mayor Creelman has been able to join us. Welcome, John. So at this time, I'd like to ask for approval of the agenda. And the motion is that council approves the agenda of session VC 15 2020 as circulated. Could I have a mover moved by Nick and a seconder seconded by Mankelo. And did you have an addition Councilor Nix? Well, it's more of a question. We had a recreation advisory committee meeting last week and we, uh, we had a person from the pickleball club appear before us, but they had sent a letter to council and we told that person that this matter would be discussed at our council meeting. It's, it's not on our agenda. I just wondered, Kim, do you, what, what, what happened with that letter? Kim? Okay, it's not there that important. There we go, sorry. Um, I thought the that most, letter from the what, what you need to know about that is that um, Pickle, they did get in touch with um, um, Mr. Simpson and um, they have, um, they no longer are asking for any money from council. Okay, Councillor Martin. Uh, and they've also shut down for now. Okay, yeah. thank you. Is there any other additions, deletions, or modifications to the agenda as circulated? Hearing none, uh, I will ask, is anyone opposed to passing the motion to approve the agenda as circulated? And seeing none, I will deem this as carried. And then the approval of the pre previous minutes from session VC 14 2020 as circulated. Could I have a mover? Moved by Mankelo and seconded by Martin, and was there any questions or concerns about the circulated minutes? Seeing none then, uh, anyone opposed to the motion? Hearing none, we'll deem that as being carried. So even though this isn't a proclamation as such, I did receive a letter to, in my mailbox today uh, attention, Mayor Laura Ryan and Council, regarding Matthew Donor CRS. On behalf of the Association of Ontario Road Supervisors, AORS, I would like to congratulate your employee, Matthew Donor, for his recent certified road supervisor certification. As well, thank you for supporting your employee, and we encourage you to publicly acknowledge this achievement. 
so this uh, letter does go on for a few more uh, paragraphs, but I just wanted to make sure that all of Council and the public know that Matthew can now use the letters CRS after his name. Congratulations, Matt. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. That's a lot of work. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, now we're on to public question period. Has there been any questions of, from the public received in writing, Mr. Simpson? We have not received any questions submitted in advance, Your Worship. Okay, and so I do see that there is Anthony uh, is logged in, uh, and your last name, Anthony, is Hosen? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so, and I understand at the town hall, you did have some questions that you wanted to ask at that time and that uh, failed to happen for you, but we do appreciate you taking the time tonight to join us for the public question period. Would you like to pose any of those questions now? Yeah, I can certainly do so. I apologize for last week. I, I just didn't, um, I stepped away from my phone and I wasn't uh, aware that uh, I was being called uh, on, the, on the meeting. So I apologize for that. <laughs> No, no need to apologize, but thank you very much for uh, attending tonight. Okay, um, thanks again. So I, I got three uh, topics that I wanted to just raise to the, the forum here. Um, I'm, I, I, I don't know if you guys are aware that I run a Facebook group uh, that's catered to the, to the mono community. Um, so I get a lot of questions, um, inquiries, that sort of thing. So I want to kind of be the advocate for many of the residents that cannot join the, the you know the council meeting here and kind of you know, speak on their behalf so three three main points that i have um i wanted to raise the first point being speeding on the town town line roads um seems to be a big factor on many of the you know the roadways within mono and i, I um, a lot of the residents has been uh raising concerns to the you know facebook group in, in regards to speeding and you know they wanted to to see where con council has plans in regards to adding you know additional signage or controls with regards to you know maybe lowering speed limits or I don't know adding uh, you know speed traps or stop signs anything like that right because uh, I live in uh, Mono Agila town line and recently moved up to Mono Agila town line um, maybe less than a year now and it's constant speeding back and forth um, on the roadways here so you're you know if I if I sit outside I would say every single car that I just drive by my house it's probably at least going to buck you know, buck, buck ten, buck twenty on, on the roads there, and me personally driving on the roads, I, I I don't see much signage to indicate that you know there's a speed limit of you know sixty kilometers per hour, to, for example. Um, not sure if that's going to help, but something to you know alert the drivers that you can't be doing you know a buck ten, buck twenty on these uh, these roads here. You kind of have to adhere by the speed limit. So just looking for your your thoughts or opinions or suggestions or recommendations on how we tackle that uh, long, you know, ongoing issue in, in uh, mono. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that question because it is an ongoing concern that we hear from many residents and we also experience ourselves um, living in the, uh, not only the urban areas, but the rural areas. Um, we've tried a number of different things and we're trying to step up our game a little bit. Uh, one is uh, to consider installing uh, the speed bumps in some of the urban areas to try and slow people down. Uh, unfortunately, those items are back ordered from the states, so we're still awaiting their arrival. Uh, I know uh, Deputy Mayor Creelman being on the Police Services Board, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion on uh, excess uh, patrols that we are trying to uh, put in different areas where there is uh, infractions and, and problems. Um, we are also using the um, radar signs to show the public what their speed is when they are traveling on the roads to get them to slow down voluntarily. Um, and I can open this up to any of the other councillors who want to make a comment on this uh, issue, but it is definitely foremost in our time uh, spent at the council table trying to figure out new and innovative ways to try and get people to adhere to safety and uh, the proper road conditions. Anyone from council? Uh, Councillor Nix? 
Yeah, yeah, I would just add, Anthony, that uh, John Creelman chaired a task for a safety task force a year ago that I set on, and uh, we looked at the problem, uh, and we did have some data. It was only for county roads in Mono, not not for town roads. And John, I can't remember the number, but I think oh something like twenty five percent of all cars, and there was a, 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 it was a large sample, twelve thirteen thousand. We're doing 20 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. That's on county roads. So I'm sure the numbers on town town roads are probably somewhat comparable. Um, we did hire, John, I'm going out of memory, an extra half of an OPP officer this year. It's, it's something like that. We did increase our police budget for this year, but it's a problem that's not easily solved. And I, you live on the town line and you have a problem there. Listen, I invite you to come down to my house on the Hockley Road on some Saturday or Sunday. Probably the average speed of cars going past my driveway is something like 120 kilometers an hour. And there's very little the OPP seem to be able to do about it. I'm not criticizing them. It's a, it's a very difficult problem to catch them. Yeah, well, I, I do understand it's a difficult issue. You um, know, I, I see it for myself here. I mean, I, I, I'm sure it's, you know, throughout the, the town of Mono. I just... Uh, you know, my personal opinion is, um, you know, if I see a little bit more of a of signage or maybe uh, those those speed signs that you mentioned, um, I'm not seeing that where I live, uh, for example. But I'm not sure if that's going to add add any um, awareness to to the problem as well, right? Um, but for me, you know, it, you know, going down the Mono Agile town line, I'm not, I don't see any signage to say, hey, listen, Anthony, you need to follow by the rules of going 50 or 60 kilometers an hour. Um, I, either I'm, I'm blind or, you know, it's just not there, right? I'm not seeing that. So I'm assuming, you know, people that are driving on the town line roads, for example, are doing whatever they, they want to do um, based on not seeing proper signage um, on the roadways. Um, and then also, you know, I, I live on, uh, you know, on a particular road that's adjacent to uh, airport road. So I'm not too far from airport road. So, you know, these, these, these speeders would probably use the Mono Angela town line road just to, you know, um, bypass the airport road, knowing there's, there's police or OPP on, on, on those roadways. Right. So they're just using, you know, the, the alternative uh, routes to, to get to where they're going and just, you know, continuing their, their speeding habits. So my suggestion, you know, if, if possible, you know, if we can get some more signage on, on the roadways, um, at least we can create some awareness around town and, you know, visitors or, or outsiders that are, traveling on on the roadways are also aware that they cannot simply just do a buck 20 they need to you know adhere by the the rules and 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 the you know the the, the speed limits uh, on the, in the town of mono so I, I i that's my personal opinion I, i'm not sure if anybody else objects by that but i think signage might might help um okay. and i'm sure there's other um suggestions that can you know also um you know be put in place as well to try to um control the situation. Yeah, uh, Deputy Mayor Creelman, did you have a comment? Um, and thank you, Anthony, and for everybody's benefit, Anthony runs a, a spectacular Facebook group uh, that deals with uh, issues uh, regarding Mono. I'm a, a happy member and participant in uh, in that group. Um, Anthony, because you live on a, on a, a boundary road, uh, one of the questions that I'm going to be raising at our next police services board is the level of enforcement, not only by the Dufferin detachment of the OPP, but also the Nottawasaga detachment of the OPP. And uh, in my view, uh, they both have a role to play here, um, and uh, we really should be doubling down on, on uh, enforcement. Um, signs are, are great but uh, there's nothing like enforcement to uh, uh, to sober people up when they uh, when they speed thank you uh sharon did you have anything that you wanted to comment on no no okay okay so uh we are uh, working on this at anthony and we continue to uh, look for opportunities to enhance our enforcement um but feel free to get back with us uh, to us with any specific area in mind that that you think it would be useful for us to 
either transfer the electronic speed sign or uh, doing some other extra patrols. And did you have another question that you wanted to pose, Council? Yep, I, I got two more. Um, second question uh, being the the maintenance uh, cost on the town line roads. Um, I live on a gravel road, and um, you know, you know, just sitting outside of my my office there on on a, on a day to day basis, I see a lot of um, I don't know town town vehicles uh, regrading the the roadways. Um, you know, on a weekly basis, if not daily. Uh, sometimes I see it daily, but I would say more weekly than anything else. Um, so my 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 question is to to council here is, what are the plans or in the possibility of maybe paving some of the roadways in in the in the town lines? Um, I'm going back to where I live, uh, Mono Agila. Um, again, a lot of uh, I'm not sure what the costs are uh, currently with regards to maintaining the gravel roads, but I, I do see a lot of um, effort. Um, in regards to, uh, you know, regrading, um, adding gravel, uh, you know, all that jazz that happens with uh, maintaining the roads um, versus maybe paving the road where costs might, might you know, kind of equal or, or be lesser, in, in, you know, on the, on the tax payers with uh, road maintenance um, in, in the town of Mono. So I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure what how that looks like today, but if we, if we can get, get some numbers across to some of the, the, the taxpayers in, in, the, in the town lines, um, I I'd, I'd personally like to see those numbers and, you know, base those numbers on versus paving the roads. I, I know there's certain people that prefer a, a gravel road versus a paved road, but, you know, if the, if the financials at the end of the day um, speaks for itself in regards to a paved road being uh, lesser of a, a maintenance cost on the town, I mean, it's very clear that, you know, maybe that's the path that we should probably look forward to, to planning in, in the near term. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nix? Yeah, Matt can probably address this too, but going on memory, Anthony, we we had a road plan report uh, in 2012 that outlined the future roads we hope to put asphalt on. The, the rough rule of thumb, and it is a rough rule, is that when average daily traffic gets a, a, or approaches 500 vehicles a day, mm -hmm. uh, your maintenance costs for gravel start to increase exponentially. And at that point, it's it's probably better in the long run to bite the bullet and put asphalt on the road uh, be, because it'll be cheaper in the long run. But just just to put that in perspective, we have a section of the blind line we've been trying to put asphalt on for a number of years now. It, it actually doesn't have 500 vehicles a day, but, but that's another story. And the current estimate is that the section between side road 10 and side road 15 will cost $4 million. And we just don't have that type of money in our budget. I can't remember the Mono Agile town line. I can't remember the traffic figures there. We do do traffic surveys uh, uh, every so often. So we keep track of the traffic numbers. And like I say, once a road starts to approach 500 vehicles a day, public works starts to seriously think about coming to council and asking for the money to put asphalt. Matt, did I do an acceptable job at explaining that or did you wanna uh, qu qualify what I said? No, you're right, uh, Fred. It's uh, $2 million for blind line, um, and that's a similar segment between lots. So um, we're about $2 million to fully road reconstruct that, not including the culverts, right? We did the culverts this year, but um, those those comparisons have to be drilled out annually, really. Uh, things are changing. Costs of equipment are growing. Uh, costs of materials are growing. Costs of doing business is growing. So. Um, it's certainly something to look at, but uh, I think the last count we did on Agila Town Line between 25 and 30 side road um, was about 280 uh, T average daily traffic, and Blind Line was sitting around the 450 to 500 mark on the last count. So we try to base it on traffic, like Fred says, and there's other things that come into play too, like property and. Uh, do we have the width to to build a road? Um, do we have to purchase property? There's lots of different things that come into it and uh, cost of equipment for grading roads. Uh, we have about 540 lane uh, kilometers of gravel roads currently. Um, so trying to pick and choose which ones we pave and which ones we don't, obviously, you know, we have to have some type of criteria, but uh, it's definitely something that we're, uh, we're looking at. And uh, we're trying to, we are trying to pave some roads and, uh, uh, we haven't been uh, we haven't done any in a couple of years, but uh, anyway, it's something that Public Works is still looking at. 
and looking for council support and direction for it. Okay, so Anthony, does that help with that question? I would say, uh, yeah. I would say yes, yes it does. Um, I, I would like to see you know more of a, a real life stat on Mono Agila. I mean, I personally see a lot of traffic here. Um, you know, being uh, um, one of the more uh, you know traveled roads here, I, I would say, in you know from what I see, um, and um, you know based on what you know the, the maintenance and and uh, the regraveling and all that stuff, I, I still like to see those numbers versus a, a paved road, right? Um, you know, what what, what a, as, as far as the taxpayer goes. What am I paying out of my pocket, um, you know, with property taxes, and where's that? Where's that going on um, with the roadways in, in in Mono, right? So, I'm not sure if we if those numbers can be shared um, with residents um, with regards to annual cost on maintaining a gravel road versus paved road, but it's something that I'm interested in, in learning a little bit more um, towards. Yeah, Anthony, you and I have ch chatted too before, and we like I mentioned to you before we did do a pilot project last year. Uh, with the limestone crusher run on uh, here in Ontario, and we also did it when we did the uh, significant culvert replacement on Mono Agila Town Line this year, 2020. We also did a section that you'll see it noted. You probably noticed a segment of uh, of the section of road uh, between 25 and 30 that we did put limestone sewn on. We have uh, had pretty good uh, to date. We've had really good experience with it. We haven't had as many calls. We haven't had to go out and treat those roads as much. We haven't had to grade it. We're not seeing the potholes. They seem to sheet the water a lot better and uh, they're standing up to traffic a lot better. So um, we're, we're applying this, the limestone crusher run on a lot of our higher volume roads that, you know, we can't go out and simply uh, fully road uh, rebuild and pave, but uh, um, that's another thing that we're trying to do in, in an effort to kind of avoid having to go out and grade um, more regularly. Okay. I, I'll be very frank with you folks. You know, I'm just um, worried about, uh, you know, one of those drivers that are speeding and with the gravel, you know, it gets a little bit slippery. It's, you know, you get, you get to a point where you can't control your vehicle and, you know, with, with three kids here in my home and, you know, we're, we're t we tend to be outdoors in front of our, our properties and, you know, I'm just I'm just worried about one of those drivers just ramming into my house because of, you know, the the, the roadways, the, the situation that we're in with the, with the gravel roads and and also with the speeding. Right, those are two factors that are concerning for me as a resident in Mono. Um, I'm, I'm I came from a city. Uh, I'm a city boy, right? So you know, moving out to Mono, I, I'm kind of adjusting to the, you know, the country life where there's gravel roads and 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 you know various other things. But you know, seeing the concerns, you know, are kind of. Um, you know, supersede the, the, the you know the other issues that are um, are you know on on my plate. So speeding and, and the gravel roads, I th I think those are two main major concerns for me. Um, in the sense that you know tragic issue can possibly happen um, on my property or any other any other property on on the town line where someone just does makes a stupid mistake and now someone's you know either killed or, or injured, right? So. I'm just putting that out there. Um, I'm just a concerned resident, so hopefully we we can uh, kind of account for that. And um, in the near term or, or long term, we kind of you know plan out something with uh, with a paved road or controlling the speeding and 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 that sort of thing, right? So I'm yeah, those are my that's my feedback on that issue. Okay, and your third question. Your question um, would be racism in the, in the community. Um, not sure what the awareness is from the, from the town regards to uh, you know like r racism as a whole. Um, I find that uh, you know being personally being uh, an outsider. Um, when I say outsider, coming from a city to a country, and I, I just I just don't feel welcomed here at, at certain certain spots in the in the in the town. Right? Um, it could be due to my skin color, it could be due to my religion, uh, various other factors. Um, I think there should be more awareness that, you know, other other others are that are coming in from other cities, uh, other nationalities, you know, are, are treated the same. Um, and you know, we've gotten feedback from the community through the through the Facebook group that there's, you know, there seems to be an issue there. Um, I wasn't sure if there was a, a awareness or some sort of newsletter that can go out to, to kind of uh, speak to a little bit more on that issue and just create that uh, that awareness that I'm looking for. 
Well, uh, from uh, the county's perspective, we have started a new uh, diversity and inclusion committee, uh, which is actually going to meet for the first time tomorrow evening. County councillors have already had uh, training regarding the issue of uh, diversity and racism in the county. Um, now, from there, I would have to defer to uh, Mr. Early in terms of our own in-house diversity training and where we're going with that. Mr. Early, do we have something uh, in play right now? Um, at this point in time, no, we've been kind of waiting to see how the county committee was going to uh, work its way out. Uh, I mean, it is countywide, it's uh, not limited to, to any one community. And I thought that would be the, the focus point to begin with. And if there was going to be a need to uh, set something up with our own council for uh, similar training that you've seen at the county, uh, we could certainly do that, and uh, we're it's something we're also looking at at a staff level, but uh, we haven't taken it down that road until this committee got going at the county. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Anthony, as far as the county is concerned, we do have, uh, I'm going to say, 15 to 18 members of uh, the Dufferin community involved in this uh, new committee. Uh, we are trying to tackle everything under that umbrella. I'm not sure at what point we're going to have um, an actual document to work from, but uh, it's, it's early days, but we definitely have uh, identified and are trying to work towards solutions and um, abilities for municipalities to use that not only for staff training but also to distribute to residents and to heighten awareness. I know the school system has been working uh, along those lines for many years but uh, we're still uh, in the early stages and uh, we, we are aware and are trying to work towards some solutions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for attending, and you're welcome to stay online and listen to all sorts of other things that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, so at this time, we'll move on then. We don't have any delegations, so we'll move on to unfinished business and deferred items. The first one is a list of unfinished and deferred council business. Is there any comments on this list? Any suggestions to add, delete, qualify? John? Um, as the issue of speeding has been uh, raised, um, I believe Council did pass a motion or did send a letter to the Minister of Transportation and possibly the Attorney General about um, uh, devices that monitor speed and our inability to deploy them due to the restrictions having to do with uh, community safety zones only and uh, uh, no speed zones um, greater than 79 kilometers per hour. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, we've raised this with the uh, Minister of Transportation uh, in our delegation, uh, Madam Mayor, as I remember, uh, and I spoke to her at uh, Roma last year and we've had absolutely no response, no feedback, uh, no, um, uh, absolutely nothing, crickets. I'd like to put this on the list as, as something where we write to them again and start basically saying that their policies are discriminatory against rural Ontario. These are uh, uh, approaches that are designed perfectly for the City of Toronto. They have 50 of these devices. Uh, they are raking in all kinds of money uh, in fact, they're taking the 50 locations and uh, redeploying those locations over the next few months. So I think we should get back on top of this. So you're referring to the photo radar um, equipment? Uh, it's, it's now called automated speed enforcement. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so we can ask uh, for Mark to put that on. And I'll gladly take that one on. 
no problem. Any other adjustments to the list? Seeing none then, we'll move on to item two, which is night 833-231, fourth line fill order regarding the fill removal. And uh, Mark has provided us with uh, a uh, memo regarding uh, response back for our request for documentation regarding the actual uh, truck tickets. And so I open it for discussion. Councillor Nix. Why do I have to go first, Ralph? Yeah. Well, you put your hand up first. <laughs> because he wasn't moving his hand. Hi, okay. Lord. I read the latest report. I, I tried to read the pictures of the truck tickets there. It's not easy because I, my eyesight's not good enough to read the numbers. And if I zoom up on them, the numbers go blurry. Yeah. Near as I can tell, the, the, the numbers coincide with the second of the reports uh, we, we got from them, the one at our last October meeting. Yeah, they're just photocopies of a bunch of tickets. I, I know that you can read the top. The top one's the only one where you can read that, that it was clean fill and where it went, where it came from. But I assume the rest are have similar words on it. I, I'm. It may not quite meet what we expected in the removal order, but I guess what I have to come back to, this is what I find frustrating, is we have our town engineers stamp report that says the fill was removed and there was no contamination. Yes, I know we didn't have a person out there on the day when most of the trucks were moving, but our engineering firm wouldn't risk their reputation by stamping that report and telling us something that wasn't true. I mean, I think I think I'm that, that's how I feel about it, Ralph. I, I know you have a slightly different perspective, so I'll I'll bow out now. Okay, Ralph. Your mic. Ralph, your mic. There we go. At a, at a previous meeting, uh, we asked um, uh, Mr. Ritchie for some documentation because we uh, that was a requirement of the filler that we have some uh, evidence that the fill was removed. And uh, Mark, in his um, memo or report, um, he uh, advised the applicant uh, that he would like to uh, that we would like to have. Uh, uh, the doc all relevant documentation. This included uh, tickets, truck logs, waybills, and invoices. We got none of that. We got a photograph of some tickets with some fuzzy numbers on them. Nobody really knows what's there except for on the top one, and I can pretty well read that, and it, it confirms that the fill was removed on a certain date and uh, came from a certain address on the fourth line and it was received by a uh, company, I think it's S-E-J-J. -J. So we, we have this photograph. Um, we don't have the tickets, which we asked for, and we didn't get anything else. Um, furthermore, Mark um, was very uh, explicit. He said uh, that um, uh, an explanation should be provided for any documents which are not available or are not part of the process of fill removal. So there are three sets of documents that are not available. We do have a, an invoice from SEJ, which doesn't document. It documents the numbers of fill tickets and the dates. Uh, so uh, we, we do have that. We don't have waybills. We don't actually have the original tickets. Um, we don't have truck logs. And we don't have any explanation for why we don't have them. And to all understand this, um, this submission to us, uh, I would, be, would think that the applicant would be really interested in moving on this and giving us all the information that he could. Um, what do we do about it? Well, uh, my, my my thought is that somebody needs to look at these uh, tickets, uh, the actual tickets, and uh, and if you'd like, call it what you'd like. It's an audit. Look at them, uh, ascertain what they are, and uh, 
uh, tell us uh, that uh, this is a this is acceptable. And somebody who's such as um, the um, uh, our QP, uh, who's a uh, an expert in fill removal, could easily look at these and say, "Okay, guys, this is girls. This is a uh, acceptable uh, uh, trip, uh, trick truck dump tickets." And uh, um, it, the evidence is that uh, they were. Uh, 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 that, the, that the trucks did leave on, on these various dates. It's significant that we, um, nobody from uh, from um, um, our engineering firm was in attendance at any of the days when the uh, fill was removed. Uh, further is, is that we asked for a clearance letter from uh, the QP, that was Richie's QP. It was a terrible letter. It basically said that we approve the process that uh, the film must have been removed because Burnside said it was removed. Uh, that was pretty terrible. No, they were not available there at the time when the uh, uh, film was removed either. Uh, furthermore, they attended the site, took some photographs, which is a part of this. The ground was covered by snow. The only way that we can tell whether the fill is actually there or not was it was a different color than the other fill. It's a grayish color. So nothing could be. Uh, further from uh, useful information than those two photographs. So I'm, I'm unhappy with it. I think we, uh, we need to pr pursue this. And, and, I, and my recommendation is, is that we have an audit um, by our, uh, our QP, having a, a look at the actual tickets, not a photograph, a fuzzy photograph of them. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor John. Can I inquire as to whether or not Burnside is, is giving its uh, sign off based on uh, viewing a photograph of what looks to me like overlapping uh, post-it notes or whether they actually saw the actual documents. Mark? Uh, Burnside's have not get, given any sign off, uh, Deputy Mayor Krillman. I think what Ralph was referring to was the QP report from uh, uh, their engineers that council had asked for. Um, I've just provided the tickets that I was provided last uh, Thursday. Well, uh, th th then that goes to my point. Uh, we're given a photograph of a series of, of uh, documents that uh, my first reaction was they look like uh, uh, post-it notes overlapping so you can't really see what they all say you could only presume that they uh, account for X number of truckloads of material. Um, this is amateur hour. I, I am beyond disappointed. And uh, I don't know what to say. It's the dance of the veils. We keep asking for information. We get a little bit, we get a little bit more, we get a little bit more, and we're not getting answers. <clears throat> okay. Councillor Martin. Well, I, I have the same issue with these, uh, these, uh, the dump copy clean fill only dump tickets. It's, it's so random. It's a very shabby way to, uh, document what's been going on. If that's, I think someone needs to physically see them and we need to get our um, engineers from Burnside to read into it whatever they can and give us um, give us some information that maybe we can work from. But this has gone on way too long. We need to move on. Uh, and obviously, we don't seem to be getting what we need to make a, any kind of a decision about anything. Okay. Councillor Nix. Yeah, I hear you all, and what you're saying is correct, that our engineer's not giving us any opinion on the, the truck tickets, but they did attend the site, admittedly not on the day the trucks are moving, but I'm going on memory because I don't have the report in front of me. They did attend the site after. I think there was five loads left to go or whatever, and they looked at it. They looked at the native soil. There were some small clumps of that grayish soil left, but in their words, the illegally imported fill, with the exception of maybe five loads, had been removed. It, it, Mark, is my memory correct? I'm, I'm sure they visited the site and that's what they said. 
Yeah, Jim Wallace was there while they uh, stockpiled the um, uh, fill to be removed. It was all stockpiled on one part of the property. Uh, Jim Wallace was out there on two occasions and actually asked for more to be removed from the property to stock to be stockpiled uh, to be removed. And then uh, he was out uh, near the end of the process uh, before it was all completed, uh, looking for the additional loads to be removed. Eugene was also in attendance uh, in between those times. Jim and, and Eugene were trying to, you know, stagger their times as well out of the property. It uh, um, obviously the 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 town was not responsible for what was being removed from the property, just making sure that what was being stockpiled and being re purportedly to be removed from the property was was uh, in place. So. And they have written us a report, which they've signed and said the fill was removed. And tested, right? I mean, if, if it's council's call to, to, to have Jim provide a, a, a rationale as was set out in my email two weeks ago, that can be certainly done. Um, I just don't see that as being our responsibility at this time to document why truck tickets or way bills aren't available, but probably uh, uh, Jim Walls may be able to if that's, you know, the process that council wants to, to move to. Okay, <clears throat> Councillor Michael. No, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Fred is completely right uh, in that uh, Burnside did um, uh, make the statement, but, but Fred, despite this, council felt that it was wise to get some um, other physical uh, evidence, uh, and we had four options, and that's what we've asked for, and we haven't got it. So let's get it. Uh, at least, at least get if 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 the tickets are authentic, and uh, Jim Walls can uh, can can tell us that. And look at them and say that I'm happy that these trucks loads went from here, etc. Then I think that we're in a position to to accept this. But uh, despite the fact that we have the engineering letter, we wanted additional confirmation. We gave them four options for confirmation, and we've really gotten a half of one of them. So let's, um, you know, I think that if I was in, the, I don't want to speak for Mr. Ritchie, but if I was in a position where people were not trusting me, I'd be bending my back to. Uh, give all the information to let people know that uh, the right things have been done and, and that's just not happening and I'm, I'm disappointed okay so what is the verdict from council do you want this issue sent back to our own engineer to do the analysis or do we want to send a response back to mr ritchie that this was not what we asked for and we want that information provided Well, I think, Your Honor, that we want, uh, uh, following Mark's uh, a letter uh, to Mr. Richard, we want what the letter asked for, and that is uh, to have the uh, uh, the uh, fill uh, dump tickets. They're in the actual tickets, not a photograph of them, the actual tickets, and have um, our, our QP uh, uh, look at them and give, them, uh, give us an opinion about them. And we should know why uh, we do not have the other pieces of information, the truck logs, waybills, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> okay. And what's the other members of council feel about that direction? Councilor well, Nixon? I'm okay with it. I, I explained before, you, you, you can ask all you want for the truck logs, but Mr. Ritchie or Mr. Martin would not have the ability to produce them. They are the they are the property of the truck owner or the more, more specifically the truck driver and the only one who has the right to demand them and take a look at them is an MTO inspector um, so you're not going to get the, the, the driver's logs well let, let Rich explain that to us he didn't do that okay. Councilor Martin no <laughs> yeah I, I agree with uh Councillor Magdalo. That's okay. it. Okay, Deputy Mayor. I agree with uh, with Ralph. Okay. And and I'd, I'd go on I'd go on to say that uh, if if I was hiring a a trucker uh, to do certain work um, and they do maintain logs they do have they have to by law um, 
I and I was in the bind that Mr. Ritchie is in in terms of having to produce proof that this material was removed from the site. A lot of his neighbors doubt it, frankly. Uh, then I wouldn't hesitate to go back to the trucker and say, I know this is an unusual request, but would you mind sharing your logs with, with uh, the town of Mono? I mean, th these logs don't contain nuclear coats. Okay. So um, that direction then will ask uh, CAO to request this information to be provided a second time in completion and also to ask uh, Jim Walls to look at the original tickets whenever they are provided and do an analysis. Everybody in agreement? Okay, everybody's nodding. Okay, thank you very much. So we're now we're on to Les's favorite time of the year, the 2021 budget presentation. Les. Hey, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just need Andrew to allow me to share my screen. Just need a few seconds. So can council see the first slide of my presentation? The first slide, yep. Okay, so I'm just, just verifying that my screen's being shared. Okay, so this is the 2021 budget. Uh, of course, we know all the councillors involved. Uh, this is more for the public, my contact information. If anyone has any questions about the budget uh, after tonight's meeting. Um, this is a new slide I put in. Uh, it's the COVID impact, uh, our lost revenues, a uh, little bigger, a little more than I last reported in my la in the financial update to council. Uh, the tax penalty is sixty-five thousand, investment income down seventy-five thousand. Most of that being interest earned at the bank. Uh, we're again pretty close to two percent annually last year, and. Uh, at this point, I think we're maybe getting 0.2 of a percent. Uh, we just received uh, recent information from provincial offenses. Uh, we already received the check for approximately 40,000. Uh, we're expecting another check for about 15. Uh, so that basically translates maybe a projected budget. I'm being a little conservative at 60,000. So compared to the budget, it's a loss of 130. Uh, we were at uh, uh, the DMOA meeting uh, last Friday and MPAC reported for whatever reason for the town of Mono, uh, they're a little slow getting onto properties to added omitted assess assessments, that being new builds uh, or additions or anything like that. So they'll have a negative impact of approximately 50,000. And of course, with the halls being closed, uh, 104,000 approximately in lost potential hall rental revenue. So that adds up to approximately about 400,000 plus. Now, the budget by the numbers, a 1% increase in the tax levy from last year is appro approximately $80,000. If council decides to do a 2% increase, obviously that is double at 160. The magic number that council uh, needs to reduce uh, to maintain a 1% inflation increase is approximately 1,090,000. And again, another year we're experiencing less growth into next year's assessment at uh, just 0.5 of a percent. And that translates to approximately $40,000. As in the past, council may recall, growth rates uh, in excess of 2%. Now this is the, the pie chart. Uh, just over 50% of the budget is roads. Uh, we're mainly a rural municipality, uh, so that makes sense. Uh, I wanted to uh, just point out the protection services of just around 20% or just under 20%. That would include 
uh, OPP, the conservation authorities, and, uh, and fire. And just to illustrate the difficulty council has in keeping a 1% budget, uh, Orangeville contract, or Orangeville fire contract uh, for 2021 is to increase by 4%. And if council recalls one of my slides from uh, last year's presentation, the conservation authorities were well above uh, the annual inflation rate. So it, it is a challenge when uh, you have about 20% of the budget you have no control over. Uh, this is just to illustrate, uh, I mentioned uh, the low growth we are now experiencing. Uh, the, obviously the peak year was back in 2016 uh, and then slowly over time, uh, we're basically our growth is uh, added severances and perhaps the odd commercial uh, development. So how do we eliminate the million 90,000 approximately to get it to 1%? We could use the 2% inflation rate, which obviously leaves less to cut. I think the internet's slowing down, so it's not loading for me. Some of the other choices we do have, uh, uh, council can uh, cancel capital projects or defer them. Uh, the ones that do need to get done in 2021, we recommend that we go ahead with them. Uh, another option council can do is reduce the 2021 contributions to reserves, perhaps by one year, hoping uh, next year's budget would be a better year. Or you can reallocate reserves from one purpose to help finance this year's. Uh, for example, last year, council use the resurfacing reserve and help uh, pay for the cost of the roads operating. Now uh, for the budget, the first three pages of the budget are the summary pages. Uh, the first two pages are summary pages to the expenditures within the budget. And uh, page two is a summary of the various revenues and page 2B is the list of the various reserves council has. I'd like to bring council's attention to the bottom of 1B. Uh, basically that's the summary. We have expenditures of approximately 14 million, uh, revenues of uh, approximately 13 million. So then there's the 1 million and 90,000 approximately to, to eliminate. Going down to near the bottom of page two, I've highlighted on the screen, uh, we had budgeted in 2020, a uh, projection of uh, 60,000 approximately for a year in surplus. Uh, as it turned out, uh, the surplus came in at over 220. Two main reasons, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one reason, our investment income was better than projected. And of course, uh, we had um, we had some cost savings in other areas uh, in, in capital works. Uh, for this year, uh, despite uh, despite the, the loss in revenues, I'm projecting a, a small surplus of less than ten thousand dollars. Page 2B is the list of reserves um, the council has full discretion over, um, majority of them. I've, I've highlighted, uh, we have received the safe return grant of 200, $204,300. As you can see, we did not have to apply it uh, for 2020 year end, uh, but it is being applied uh, the whole amount uh, for the 2021 budget. So basically council has all the discretion with these reserves, except as I move to the bottom of the page, uh, as council is familiar with parks and loop, gas tax and development charges, there's more rules and restrictions in, in using those funds. Uh, we have used those funds where we can, uh, but basically, uh, like I said, there are guidelines for it.
page three of the budget are council's expenditures. Uh, basically, uh, we're coming in under proje uh, the projection is under is under budget compared to the 2020 final budget, and some of the cost savings uh, would be in training and development. Uh, we had just the one newsletter, or the cost of the newsletter came in under budget, and of course, there's no hall rentals, so there's no hall donated uh, rentals. If there's no questions there, pay the next page, or at the bottom of the page, sorry, is the Hockley Lands property. Now for the 2020 budget, uh, regarding the contribution to the pollinator garden, uh, last year council, they say last year for 2020, council budget $5,000. I'm recommending that be reduced to 3,000. If you refer back to the reserve page, uh, the pollinator garden is actually, uh, has a well, uh, well balanced. Uh, it's been the experience this year and even last year to a certain extent that donations uh, are exceeding the actual expenditures. So I've made that reduction. Hello? Hello? Yeah, Les? Yes? Uh, I can tell you the way the, the streams committee is going. We really only had one project this year. Uh, it's been difficult to work with the conservation authorities in this environment. So I can't see, I mean, this is a small change, but I can't see that we would need that $2,000 in 2021. There, I just cut $2,000 off the budget. Oh, okay. I don't hear, I I don't hear okay. any problems. So I'll make that a zero. And, and, and if Ralph was decent, he'd cut the 3,000 out. If Ralph and Sharon were, but they won't. But uh, that's a joke, Ralph and Sharon. <laughs> that's, I don't know how you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if we move on from that page to page four. Um, the top part of page four is the administration costs of, uh, of the office. Uh, basically, the, uh, the treasury staff, the clerk staff, and basically the admin staff salaries and benefits. As well as you will notice uh, the inside maintenance compared to $11,000 budget. Uh, projection is $25,000, and uh, the reason 100% due to COVID, uh, obviously this year, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had uh, staff coming in on a regular basis, three, four times a day versus just a weekly clean or maybe two times a week. So that's the increase in that cost. Yeah. And below is the Heritage Committee. Um, and again, assuming they did not, because of COVID, they did not get onto their projects. Not sure what's happening with COVID next year. It's, it's a gamble again. Uh, I basically left the materials budget, uh, or budget for 2021 at 1,000 versus that the 10 that they had last year or for this year. Uh, assuming they, because of physical distancing, they won't be able to get around to accomplishing anything in 2021 as well. Page five, um, uh, this is the, the cost of the office for services, materials, and supplies, um, as well as uh, maintenance of the building. Uh, one I want to point out uh, down to line 1263, okay, I'll just highlight the number 85,000 right off. We had budgeted 40,000, that 85, uh, Basically, we were on budget for approximately the 40,000, but what came in or for in this year uh, was the Tai Chi Center. Uh, they've been in court with uh, AMPAC. Uh, I'm assuming it's been many years. Like I think it's pushing pushing four years or uh, ten years, and uh, they 
uh, were able to be awarded a huge reduction in their assessment. And because of the multiple years, uh, worked out to just over 40,000 uh, for Mono's cost. Uh, of course, there's still the county cost and uh, the school board. Now, this isn't just specific to the Mono Tai Chi. Uh, it was a decision made for all their centers across Ontario, and of course, Mono got uh, uh, included in that. Uh, for capital projects, we'll go to notes page one in a, in a second. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, for next year, uh, we're doing the CBC study. So uh, that's, that's to meet the legislation. Um, I uh, got an approximate quotation of 15,000. We're going to have uh, Watson's continue the study because they just completed our DC study in 2019. So that's being totally funded by DCs. Uh, we have to have an updated asset management plan by July 1st, 2021. Approximate cost of that is 100,000. Uh, that is eligible by gas tax, so you'll see where that is being funded. And annually, we receive revenues from our solar panels, uh, about 60,000 per year. And that amount, whatever the revenue is, we transfer it to, to a reserve. And uh, we started a new reserve a couple years ago, $15,000, and that's for the HVAC lighting or any future roof repairs. Okay, Fred? Yeah, Les, on that, I, I know the $60,000 from the solar panels, um, I can't flip to the page, but it goes back in to pay back the reserve that we borrowed the money from to build that those solar panels. But we're getting pretty close to paying that off, aren't we? And it's, it's some point uh, yeah. soon. It's, 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 it's with, uh, after this year, I believe, is just nec it's next year. So 2022 is the last year. The original, the original payback was between six and seven years, and it's, it's just over seven. Okay, okay. Only because, Thanks. as you can appreciate, as the age of the solar panels, while well, it gets older, uh, they're not producing the electricity like they did when they were brand new. Page six, uh, that's, uh, that's the administrative uh, revenues. Uh, again, uh, line 7118, tax penalty and interest. As you can see, the project project the penalty interest is below the 200 budget. I reduced the budget, uh, anticipating a slight reduction for next year at 195. Uh, our original budget for investment income uh, was 240 for 2020. The projection is 165. And then with interest right now, uh, we'll have a full year of bank interest at a very low rate. So um, budgeting of 150 and mainly, basically we have 12 months of low bank interest. Uh, line 7200, you'd see the 100,000 coming from gas tax to finance the asset study. I've highlighted the safe restart grant of 204. That's where you're finding it within our numbers. Now, um, with I guess I have to, I'll go back up to page five. I wanted to point out to council under other services, line 1259, where it says note two, I mean, the budget has increased to 45,000 and that's, due to a $24,000 market salary study. Uh, we had budgeted that originally last year and the council recalls that was uh, deferred and said it would be done uh, in this year. And that's being financed out of our admin reserve, uh, the full 24,000. And of course the 15,000 in revenues to finance the CBC study. Now, if we go to notes page five, this is a list of our capital project. Now, our original budget for 2020 for computer hardware slash software, uh, basically software, our, our annual license fees. Uh, 
because of the push to keep the office open and uh, and also having the ability to still uh, provide full admin services from home, uh, we we did purchase additional uh, computer, comp uh, well, laptops, software to allow staff to work from home. Uh, that brought us over the budget of thirty-five thousand. Because of that increase. Uh, we're recommending the council authorize. Uh, we had received the uh, efficiency grant last year of over 500,000. Uh, so we're recommending because we had to become more efficient working from home, that 10,000 come from that grant. Uh, in the capital projects list, there was the $3,000 to uh, replace the, the firewall plus the $3,000 for security and basically using the admin reserve to pay for that. If you go into the projected column, uh, the recent update that council authorized for the uh, for recording council meetings of 11,625, uh, that was not in the original budget, but council authorized to take it out of, uh, out of reserves and we're recommending using it uh, the efficiency grant again uh, to utilize that. Uh, we reported the uh, office fixtures need to be replaced, uh, approximate cost of 45000 and again uh, we're using uh, an office reserve to, to pay for that. And then $10,000 uh, to the Klondike pit, our annual contribution for future rehab uh, when the pit is closed. Les, I'm wondering if I could take you back to uh, the upgrade office security um, without getting into too much detail there that might be more appropriate in camera. Why do we need to spend $3,000 when the building is already alarmed and so forth? Uh, well, okay, maybe, maybe that's a little misleading the title. Actually, that's for new cameras, uh, replace the existing cameras. Uh, Kim may want to Correct me. I believe there's six cameras, and then that three thousand uh, adds two additional cameras, where there isn't cameras in you know in a couple locations at the moment. So the security systems in place is just upgrading uh, the cameras. Cameras are very very cheap. I'd be surprised if if uh, you can buy a lot of cameras for three thousand dollars. Right. Um, even if if you even have to. Right. Um, I, I guess my only comment is uh, there's no impact on the tax rate or the tax levy only because it is being financed out of reserve. So uh, if the cameras do come in, say $1,500 to $2,000, then only that amount will come out of the reserve. I see it as all coming from one pot. I always have. I, I understand that, yes. Hey, Ralph. Your Honor. Ralph. Um, Les, Les, could you um, uh, clarify what are the criteria for using the uh, uh, efficiency grant? Uh, basically, uh, the only guideline that the province gave us there was, uh, was any kind of expenditure that they, uh, we deemed to make the municipality more efficient in, in the operations of our business. And it was basically left wide open to the municipality's interpretation what that meant. And so, and that grant was for how much? I'm sorry. How much was that grant for? If you go back to page three, I'll bring that up for you. The original I grant. You said. Yeah, the original grant we received was five hundred fifty-seven thousand four forty. Right. We're using okay. approximately ten thousand this year, and then we're projecting to use about thirty-one next year. So a good portion of it's still available. Right. Thank you. Uh, page seven is the summary for, for the fire departments. Uh, before we go to the notes page, I uh, just wanted to touch on the revenues below. 
the charge of fire calls as for the MVCs that we built to the insurance. Uh, because of the COVID uh, lockdown, uh, there was less traffic between the m months of March and, and June, uh, but then it did pick up. So we're not quite getting to 180, but we're anticipating 144. Uh, with most of the lockdown lifted in our area, uh, I'm, I'm budgeting again the 180. The notes to page seven are the four fire departments. Uh, the Orangeville amount, uh, that's by contract. Like I mentioned earlier, it's going up by 4%. Uh, Shelburne at this point, uh, I don't have a budget amount. I believe I used approximately 2%. Caledon, we're anticipating a projected year and of 35,000 less than we budgeted for 2020. Uh, so I'm uh, proposing the same budget for 2021. And uh, Rosebond, I, I have left uh, the same amount. And then the co capital contributions to Rosemont and Shelburne are below that. If there are no questions on that page, page eight, uh, the conservation authorities. Uh, we already received the budget amount for the NDCA. Uh, our levy is only increasing by $200. Uh, that levy is determined by, by assessment of all the municipalities participating and with other municipalities in, in the conservation area having higher assessment, more growth, uh, they're picking up more of the cost. So uh, I guess that's one benefit of not having the assessment growth in moment. And of course we have the 15,265 as part of our Vicki Barron uh, trail maintenance agreement. Page eight, uh, bylaw enforcement. Uh, just want to bring council's attention to, to the legal fees. Uh, we had budgeted 20,000, uh, projecting a year end amount of uh, 70,000. And uh, of course that's to do with the additional legal costs and the engineering services uh, regarding the three bylaw enforcements uh, that council is still currently uh, working with. For 2021, I'm hoping the worst is over. And uh, even though it's more than the 20,000 budget for 2020, I budgeted uh, 40,000. Uh, below that is animal control. Uh, basically the Orangeville SPCA and their contract increase uh, is generally by by <clears throat> by inflation of the CPI so next year's budget I'm using the amount of 17,690. 17, <clears throat> Page 10 is uh, policing. The numbers look a little wonky here and uh, for 2020 budget uh, for OPP contract or the police contract, we had budgeted 1, 1, 226000 and then uh, under community policing directive patrols, we put in 64000 A uh, good part of that cost, uh, we budgeted uh, for the additional officer that council had applied for to OPP. We weren't sure if, uh, if that would be approved, I assume we it would, uh, but not for how long. Uh, but for the projected, uh, I have put the entire cost of the OPP contract with the additional officer uh, entitlement at one point of 1,282,000. The budget for 2021 is 1,280,000. It's a little less uh, only because the 1,282,000 includes an initial, uh, I guess, startup cost or whatever to deploy the additional officer time. The policing revenues, uh, what you see are negative amounts. Uh, basically, a negative amount is a carry forward 
deficit in the contract. So what that means is, for example, in 2020, uh, we had budget, of, uh, the, old, the police had given us from the previous year, uh, the contract included, we had to make up 17,000 uh, in the budget. I like to separate those two amounts out so we know the true cost of police from year to year and then the below numbers, uh, either it's a surplus or a deficit. As you can see, the actual in 2019 is a positive number of approximately 13,000. So in that year, uh, there was a surplus that was passed on to Mono uh, from that contract. For 2021, uh, the OPP are, have told us that there will be a deficit to, to pay for from the prior year of approximately 25,000. On an annual basis, we also get a provincial grant. Uh, we didn't budget anything in 2020, but we did receive $6,600 approximately. I'm budgeting 5,000 for 2021. And miscellaneous revenues are, are costs that the OPPs get awarded, uh, I guess with, with their traffic enforcement and they pass that on to us. And in 2020, I'm projecting based on the numbers we have already, of 10,325 and approximately the same amount for 2021. If there's no questions there, we'll move on to page 11. This is the cost of roads administration. Basically the savings are uh, what happened in 2020. If you go to 1250, three training and development. We had budgeted $30,000 anticipating a uh, year end to be both 15. Um, pretty much all of the training and courses uh, that happened across the board for all departments uh, was done uh, by streaming versus going in person. So there are cost savings that way. Uh, anticipating things to get a little better next year and uh, I have the budget at 20,000, a little bit more than the year and projected, but still less than last year's budget. If there's no questions there, we go on to page 12. That's the, the shop next door. Um, the main highlight on this page is, uh, as Matt reported in his capital works projects for 2021, the fuel supply system next door is being replaced. So basically the underground tanks will be removed, new pumps are being installed, uh, basically a envir a more environmental friendly. Uh, at the moment our tanks are not leaking, uh, but it's more of a preventative measure uh, because these tanks, were, like I said, will be above ground. Can I ask a question on that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, and it's a fairly simple-minded question, Les. Um, I know they have to be replaced at some point. Uh, they're not leaking now, and Matt, if you tell me what the right word is, but you, you've done some test, was it an electrolysis, whatever it was called, but you haven't detected any rust down there. So yes, they have to be replaced at some point. What if we spread that $230,000 over two or three years? Like, what if we did the tanks in 2022, and so in the 2021 budget, we only had to put half that amount. Now, you're gonna say that's coming out of reserves anyway, but but if we can save that expenditure, surely it, it helps us, it eases up on where we can use reserve money, doesn't it? I, I, as I say, it's a simple-minded question, but I have to ask well, it. If I could answer for Matt, as you could see in previous years, uh, we had already spread the cost of the tanks over several years, so it would not be a big hit in one year. As you can see, there was a budget or a reserve contribution in 2020 of 90,000, and then a further uh, contribution the previous year, 19 of 90,000. And we lost the 2018 column, but there was a reserve contribution uh, at that time towards the tanks. So we kind of, what, what you are suggesting, Councillor, we have done the cost of the, those tanks over multiple years by annually putting those reserves in. 
And you're right, it, it is coming out of reserves anyways, because those reserves have been built up over the years. But, but my point still is, since we have the liberty to move money from one reserve to another, if if and and I'll I'll go by Matt's judgment on this because I you know I feel terrible if something happened and they started to leak, but, but we don't have any indication that's about to happen. I guess that's what I'm saying. If we de delay it by one more year and use that money in that reserve for some other purpose, it would still help us with the budget. Um, I've asked the question. Okay. So. We're required to do uh, cathodic testing every other year, Fred, under TSSA, and all signs are showing that the tanks are still holding up, um, but we don't know really what's down there. We, have, we can't inspect it physically, so that's what we're relying on. So, But, but as you said, Matt, the, the tests that you do are showing that the tanks are holding up. They are. It's like your car, though. Holding up today. All my car is going to last another. My car is going to last another fifteen years. Okay. Ralph. Uh, question, uh, Matt. How old are these tanks? I believe they were installed in '92, and I don't have a lot of detail on that install. Right. All right. We, we did complete some upgrades last year to the pump system. The pump system is fairly a like, fairly good system and reliable system. Um, we don't have the ability to, to rec record fuel uh, quantities. We have to do manual dip tests for it. So there's some inefficiencies there and tracking fuel to, to fleet and all those other types of things that would be included in these upgrades in the future. But uh, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're operating now. Um, we rely heavily on them, obviously. They're utilized daily. Um, so we, wouldn't, we, we couldn't afford to have them out of service, that's for sure. So we, we, we would definitely be pushing it to, 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 to delay it further. Is, is 29 years or 28 years a long time for a, a um, I guess they're a steel tank to be buried in the ground and... Uh, what, what, what kind of lifespan do you sort of expect? I think that what Fred's concern is that maybe if these tanks are supposed to be good for twice that long, uh, we don't probably don't have much to worry about. But um, uh, I don't I don't have those figures. I don't know the exact time frame, Ralph. Um, but again, I don't have a lot of detail on the install installation and all the components what were installed at the same time. I think there was bits and pieces installed back in the 90s. Um, I don't think the pumps were installed at the same time. Some of the some of the uh, the plumbing that goes from the tanks to the fuel pumps were completed at that time and, and the cathodic system I believe was installed at that time. Um, but I was going on based on recommendations from some of the suppliers and we've used different ones over the years uh, to, to do the repairs and we could just rely on that kind of thing at this point in time, I, I, with a, just the cathodic testing. I, I know it's not the same thing, Matt, but I have two steel tanks in my basement that are 45 years old, and they're in perfect shape. I know, they're not buried, but... <clears throat> yeah, the, the transfer piping, too, was uh, was one of the things that they brought up as a, as a potential concern. Um, they're not double-walled uh, transfer pipes that go from the tank to the uh, the pumps themselves. Um, so the upgrade to those would be included in again in, in this in this work, but uh, that was one of the other items that the the contractors uh, that had we've had come to site had uh, identified as a potential concern moving forward. And they're no longer you wouldn't be able to install it today like it was before. Um, but there's a lot of cases that where that type of stuff happens. But uh, that was just a concern that there could be a potential that the pipes could burst between the pumps and the tanks themselves. So that would be the biggest thing rather than the, the tanks going themselves. Okay, Sharon, um, <clears throat> just curious, would the uh, new tanks be above grade? Or are they still burying them? The, uh, 
the thought was to have them above so we could do better physical uh, visual inspections of them. Um, we would probably have to do a little bit of uh, tinkering as far as hiding them. Um, but the thought was if they're above ground, you could have uh, a better idea of what you have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if there has been uh, some upgrade in the pumps, what's to prevent us from simply replacing the uh, buried tank with an above ground tank uh, as f phase one and then phase two in another year replacing the pumps? Uh, the overall configuration of how the efficiency, how we would lay out the parking lot would probably, we were initially thinking that the tanks would likely go to the west of the parking lot. Um, the public works parking lot rather than have them over between uh, the, the town hall and the works yard. So we would have to run new lines back from the other side and then bring power over there as well. So we'd want to disturb the asphalt in, in one go and get all the plumbing and, and electrical completed at the same time. Could, couldn't, couldn't you also move the, the pumps at the same time if they're, if they're satisfactory um, and, then, uh, and then replace the pumps at some point in the future? In other words, move the entire installation to where you really want it, but not do it all at once. It's certainly a possibility, but I don't know if you're going to end up saving much in that. Sometimes when you when you do uh, when you move things around and uh, the cost is ends up increasing as far as excavation, trying to handle them carefully and and uh, salvage salvage these things and uh, keep the parts and find parts for it and uh, uh, it, it, it may become challenging. Yep. Not saying that's not a possibility, it just uh, it might end up being just as costly or maybe more. Uh, Madam Mayor, if I could ask Councillor Nix a question. Um, were your thoughts instead of using the 230 reserve for the tanks uh, use them uh, for another purpose, and that's yes. the reason to delay. Um, I, I, I felt I, I mean, yes, that was what I was thinking. Okay. I, I know. Um, I, I guess I was just going to say, in listening to this discussion that you're having with Matt, Matt used the word efficiency a few times. Uh, it is my understanding that the system that would be put in would be much better, modern, uh, over and above protecting the, the environment. I'm wondering if Council is open using the efficiency uh, grant that we received uh, for this project, because it does check off some of the boxes. Great. Well, if, if we don't have any other designated purpose for that, the remaining efficiency grant, yeah, maybe this is a great if you can use it, if it goes by the rules, if it does make things more efficient, uh, then let's go for it. Now, does Council make, want to make that this change now, or just kind of keep that thought in our back pocket as we move along? Um, I, I just see that Mark has logged in here. Is Mark, you had a comment? Just on the efficiency grant, one of the things that uh, you may want to have in the back of your mind too is the, the need for the San Salt Dome and the south end where all your subdivisions are and, and the asphalt and the sidewalks are. And that was one of the uh, big ticket items that we were reserving a large portion of that efficiency grant for. Uh, just again, it's, it's, it would make the words works uh, road guys uh, much more efficient. So that's what we had kind of ear, earmarked it for at least a portion thereof. Um. I think that we should carry on with uh, the discussion of the budget that you're presenting, less uh, unless there's something that. Okay, and then maybe come back to this item if we have to. Well, or you know, what a, whatever other items come up that we have to. Okay. Review. Page thirteen. Uh, that, that's the roadway operations. Uh, basically, all the road maintenance uh, is included on this page.
Uh, the projected is a, the total projected uh, for operations is a little bit over budget. A uh, couple of spots I could highlight for council, uh, brushing labor, uh, talking to uh, Matt, the operations foreman, uh, they had the opportunity to do some brushing catch-ups uh, from past year storms. It was it was a, a good activity to do with physical distancing. Uh, there was another minor spot down, uh, but basically pretty close to the budget for 2021. Uh, we're doing uh, proposing a budget of one million seven eighty five. Okay, John. I don't know if anyone has looked at a, an, a at an ash tree lately, but it looks like we have the um, the blight big time in Mono, and a lot of those those trees are planted uh, on uh, on or near road allowances. Do we have any money in the budget for uh, removal of of those trees uh, that could be threatening uh, town roads? Um, Matt could answer that perhaps, but I'm assuming that would be under the brushing labor uh, line. I, I, would think, I would think so, but it's it's more than more than conventional brushing. These are, are in yeah. many instances very large trees, and yeah, John, uh, I don't know how quickly they come down after they uh, they get infected. Hi, John. Uh, yeah, we have been tackling a lot of uh, of dead elm and uh, ash trees and willow trees and uh, a pile of other ones um, especially I guess since 2016 when we had that uh, ice storm March 2016 when we had that fairly significant uh, ice storm so the guys have been tackling it um, yeah I believe it falls under uh, uh, the brushing item that we've used in the past which is uh, Line 30, 30, 31, 30, 30. Yeah, 30, 31, 30, 30. And uh, a lot, of, most of our staff now have chainsaw training and have been doing uh, a lot of it are uh, in house. We do have a wood chipper or two that we purchased in, I believe, 2017. And uh, so we've been doing a lot of it on our own. But when we can't, we've uh, been contracting it out to uh, three, three different companies to uh, um, help us out with that. But yeah, we have been tackling it. Elm and ash are fairly uh, strong uh, trees, and they're not usually a big concern with them falling down. But the branches, I guess, for, usually from the they die from the top, and uh, the branches do become a concern. So we're attending to them as uh, as we become aware of them. That's for sure during patrol, and uh, as we get calls from residents, we have to have to. We've been reviewing a lot of those, uh, a lot more of them, the last few years. Okay, if there are no further questions on that page, we'll go to the notes on page 13. This would be the list of the capital projects. Uh, the top items, uh, well, first of all, we have the 10,000 traffic counts that we do annually, uh, the transfer to the gas tax reserve, uh, and the revenue summary, we have an offset from the government to offset that cost. The first two bridges, Bridge 5 and Bridge 9, uh, we're transferring funds uh, to the bridge reserve. Bridge 10 and 11, uh, if, you, if you recall, uh, in Matt's capital presentation, uh, he moved those two bridges up to 2021. As a, they are both rehab bridge, and it would be more efficient to rehab the two bridges at the same time. And then I believe... Uh, bridge nine, uh, we're reserving 400 this year, uh, but it's slated for a, a replacement in 2022. Further down the list are the cost of the various roads, uh, the 400,000 to blind line reserve. Uh, we have an annual 
amount of culvert replacement of driveways, that amount is being increased to 25,000 this year. Gravel resurfacing, a uh, slight increase in that cost for 2020. Uh, 150,000 has been budgeted for uh, guide rails for 2021. Uh, we basically have spent that amount the last couple of years. And in the bottom three numbers, reserve for resurfacing 60,000, Purple Hill reserve for completing the balance of Purple Hill road replacement of 100,000 into reserve, and then an annual fence reserve of 2,000. Fred? Um, I, I hope I'm on the right page. The, the, the blind line county road 10 to 15 drainage improvements, they, they were done this year. So the, the 400,000 showing in the draft 2021 budget is to go into a reserve uh, to put asphalt between the 10th and 15th side road, correct? Correct. Okay, I, I'm going to argue, and I've I've told Matt this already that I'm going to argue that we should cut that from this year's budget uh, for two reasons. One, uh, Matt has already said that the AADT on that section of road, while it's getting close to 500, has not quite got to 500 yet. So, in a technical sense, it's just on the verge of needing asphalt. But the, the other thing that, that I always keep in the back of my mind is the one of the main reasons that they want to, that Public Works wants to put asphalt on it isn't so much the traffic volumes, it's the fact that it's used as the detour route for, for Highway 10. And I know that because I've personally come down Highway 10 from a fire board meeting and, and had to detour off over the blind line. But I think twice less we've applied for provincial grants At least uh, for that. At yeah, and we've, been, and, we, and we've been turned down. And, and so we're trying to put asphalt on a road that's used as a detour road for a provincial highway, and they won't give us a grant. And their argument is our finances are in, such, are in too good shape. And so here we are trying to build up a reserve up to $2 million so that in a few years we can put asphalt on it. And I, I just don't feel, A, this is really that compelling a, a need and, and I have some misgivings about local taxpayers having to build this detour route for the province. I second Fred's position. So, um, Fred, what amount would you like me to reduce that to? Zero. I'd like you to take all four hundred thousand dollars out. Zero. I'd support that. Aaron, are you okay with that? Your mic? No. Okay. It uh, it got lost. The mic got lost for a minute. I yes, I support that. Oh, okay. So all right, let's make it so. Okay, it's zero. I've highlighted in red to highlight the change. So, so for the record, I've chopped four hundred and two thousand dollars out of the budget so far. I haven't heard Ralph, John, or Sharon chop anything out. <laughs> you just, not done yet. You just be quiet. You I'm about. just holding. <laughs> I'm biding my time. Okay. okay. Um, is there any, anything else on this page, Council, or? I think you're okay to go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> page, <clears throat> excuse me, page 14 are our various vehicles. The first few lines uh, are the general cost of vehicles across the board for all of them. As I reported my financial update to council for 2020, we're projecting a fuel savings of approximately 30,000. So the projected year end of 170 versus the 200 budget. I'm bringing the budget back up to 200. Um, there seems to be evidence of fuel prices starting starting to increase. Um, I'll bring it back to the same budget. <clears throat> the notes of 625 
Uh, we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, the whole 625 actually is the purchase of a new grader, and then we have the annual contribution to equipment reserves of 250. The balance of the next two pages are all the equipment, uh, the cost of the town staff to maintain them, any materials or supplies or, or garage services that are required to service the equipment. Uh, for 2021, I'm just looking for it. We have a new piece of equipment as council is aware of. Uh, we do have the new sidewalk maintenance uh, tracker. I just don't seem to find it. Page 14, as I mentioned, uh, is, the, is the capital, the, the greater was as council's knows it was budgeted for 425 in 2020. Uh, the tenders came in approximately 200,000 plus more. We're hoping for a more tender, a more favorable tender result next year, uh, but still an increased cost. Uh, so we're budgeting 625. Now, later on in the budget on the revenue side, uh, that entire amount is coming from equipment reserves. I, I still would like to ask a question on it. And I've already given Matt a heads up that I'll be asking this question, and he's already given me an answer. So I'm I'm just doing this so that the public is aware we are questioning staff about these matters. I know the grader is two or three years older than its expected lifespan. I know we put out a tender last year. It came in that came in very surprisingly at something like six hundred and ninety eight or six hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars. I know we have to replace this, but I feel I have to ask this question. If we went to the company or the person, Matt, I forget his name, who does the heavy duty maintenance on that grader, and we said to him, look, if we did a complete overhaul, or replace the transmission, or spent $50,000 on the existing grader, could we get another four or five years life out of it? Now, in some sense, Matt, it's, it's unfair of me to ask you that question because you're probably well you're probably a better mechanic than i am but I, I i i obviously don't know the answer to the question i just feel i have an obligation that that question should be put on the table no well, it's certainly a fair question fred um there's a possibility that they they made them good there's a lot less electronics and older pieces of equipment but they are older and it's inevitable that we have to replace them and it, the time runs out on them so I don't know when that time is. I'm not even sure if Osprey Equipment, um, who services our equipment, would know that for for certain. Um, we could put, certainly put money into it and potentially buy one, two, three, four more years, and maybe not. Um, we can't afford not to have uh, the graders in service, and that goes for any piece of equipment over there. Any one of them could fail at any given time, and that's why we associate a, a life uh, life expectancy to everything. Um, but yeah, th th there's yeah, there's a possibility that it may last, and there's potential it may not. Could we at, for at least phone Osprey Equipment and get an opinion as to whether this is someplace a counselor should just butt out, or maybe it's a really good question? And hey, let's get back. We'll get back to you on it. Yeah, and I, Matt and Matt has already reached out. No, given the what happened earlier on this year with the, with the, the the greater tender Matt had already made effort to contact Osprey to come out and do, go over the machine completely uh, because it's overdue and we wanted to ensure that we would get through this winter especially um, so we did a bunch of work on the circle board the part that's pivots for the for the mold board and we did tire some tires on it we did some other mechanical uh, repairs on it and if we did tender again in early January, February of 2021 for a new grader and it came in again astronomically high, we would have to reassess and decide where we go from there. But uh, like I said, we can't keep the machines forever and patch them up, but there's got to be a time that frame there where you're putting too much money into it to, to try to keep it going. And, and as a supplemental question, isn't there another grader that we're going to have to replace next year? Uh, actually, 2022, yeah, in 2022, uh, the 2005 grader, Volvo grader, and in 2000, 
26, uh, we have a 2009 grader that's due for replacement. Why, why does that grader in 2022 have to be replaced when it's not even 20, 20 years old? It's the hours on them. We're trying to we're trying to focus how many hours, and a lot of the uh, equipment we're dividing out the how many hours per year is generally what, what gets put on them, and the approximate life cycle of that machine. So some of them are running two shifts, like the I believe I believe the what I, I shouldn't say which one because I'm not 100 percent sure. I know one was running the afternoon shift as well, so. Some of them get used more, and some of them are in the hills, and they get more stress put on them, right? So, okay. Well, thank thanks for your answer, Matt. I just I felt it had to be asked, and I still think I don't know if I help it, right? But um, I know it's a tough question, it's a tough answer, tough to answer. Okay, getting back to the the main budget. If council has no further questions on vehicles, page 16, um, basically our street lighting and, uh, and crossing guard. No, no real big impact or changes there. Uh, the crossing guard, because the schools were closed uh, this year, uh, there's a slight saving there. Uh, other than that, pretty much budgeted the same as in 2020. Page 17 is the revenue page. It would make more sense to look at uh, the notes to page 17. So if we could flip to that. Um, regarding provincial grants, uh, I have not received any word on the OSEP grant, uh, we received 2006 this year, um, budgeting at least 200 for next year. Anything more uh, would be bonus. From our various res reserves, uh, 625 from equipment reserve uh, to finance the grader we were just discussing. 230 from the shop reserve to finance the fuel tanks and supply system. And then even though the description says bridge 39, actually that was for this year, 2020, the million dollars for 2020 uh, are for the other two bridges that uh, are 500,000 each uh, that we're doing the rehabilitation for in 2021. And then uh, from development charges for 2021, uh, $10,000 to pay the finance for the salt dome investigation of uh, locating an additional one uh, in the south end. If there's no questions there, page 18 is the sanitary landfill site. Uh, an update for council, this is the first year we are not contributing to the landfill reserve. Uh, we have achieved uh, the amount that the auditors have recommended for uh, if we ever do fully close down the landfill or the rehab of the landfill. So we're approximately $700,000 at the end of this year in, in reserve amount. And that has been determined to be adequate with Burnside support. Uh, so no reserve for 2021. Page 19, uh, that's the budget for uh, the cemetery and basically uh, Mitchell's church. Uh, Twelve fifty four. the main contract, half of that uh, is for cemetery uh, lawn maintenance and uh, the balance of that, well actually 15,000 of the 25 would be for cemetery lawn maintenance and the, and the balance. Uh, maintenance of, of the church. Ralph? Uh, Your Honor, uh, Councillor uh, Martin and I have conferred about the uh, MPG uh, uh, 
amount of three thousand dollars which is in the budget and we feel that we can handle uh, things next year without that so i know it's a small amount but as we're sharpening our pencils we'd like to suggest that uh, we re reduce that to zero okay have to remind me to go back to that page. It's a few scrolling up uh, to reduce it to zero. Right. Uh, page 20, um, basically recreation that men, uh, just want to point out to council, line 1249, uh, materials and supplies. Uh, Kim could provide more detail on this. There's approximately $10,000 she's upgrading her booking software and if you look below in the revenues, we're suggesting that satisfies the efficiency grant criteria. Uh, so the $10,000 would be financing that software upgrade. Page 21, uh, the top portion of the recreation committee cost and uh, the community expenditures actually is the transfer to the CDRC arena. Uh, I don't have a budget amount yet uh, from the arena board, uh, but I basically increased it about 2% for next year. Page 22, recreation programs. Um, a lot, of, a lot of these costs determine if we can even go ahead with them uh, because of COVID. Uh, an obvious one uh, being uh, Winterfest, uh, line 1275. We budgeted $4,000 last year. Uh, I mean, Winterfest took place before before the COVID lockdown, obviously because it's in January. Uh, so a lot of these programs are dependent on what happens with, with the COVID pandemic. Les, the Recreation Advisory Committee met last week and Winterfest is off. So there's $4,000 in cost savings there, but then there's gonna be $2,000 in revenues on the next page that that uh, you have to take off too. But we've already decided it's not going ahead. Uh, uh, actually, Councillor Nix, if I can just jump in there. Um, um, the committee did talk about things like running um, ice sculpting or snowman making contests similar to the Halloween judging contest so um, just you know there could be because, some there could because, be some finances involved with that that's why there is a little bit of money put into there I don't I don't know we but that's, you could do that in if, your spare time part of me you thought you could do that in your spare time judge this Snowman, snow, snow, snowman contest. Got it. <laughs> well, I, I unless it's a very small number, leave it in, take it out. I'm just telling you that Winterfest is off the books. Correct. Winterfest, as we know, it is not happening. Well, basically, the way that with the revenues budget at two, uh, the cost of Winterfest is two thousand in this budget. Yeah. So if Kim proceeds with some form of uh, Winterfest, uh, the new way, I guess, uh, there, there would be money in the budget for it. Okay. May not be 4,000, say it comes in under 2,000, and then, yeah. and then at least it's on budget overall. And of course, the biggest program we have uh, is soccer. We're budgeting for soccer to be break even only because we're looking at, uh, well, Kim could address this, uh, increasing some of the fees uh, just to cover the cost of the program. And again, I mean, it, it's pandemic, uh, depends what happens with that. But in this budget anyways, uh, it's an offset. There's no question. There, just wanted to start. I doing. have one. Okay. Uh, the um, community cleanup day is indicated as a zero. Um, 
have we not talked or or maybe thought about some kind of of uh, day that is uh, identified where we'd each go out and try and and pick up uh, garbage and litter on the uh, on the side roads. I, I'm taking. I, I'm assuming that that is what is uh, uh, defined as community cleanup day. Not that it has um, to cost much. Yeah. I mean, maybe the cost of the plastic bags. And normally we can get those plastic bags donated from the county. That's what they've done in the past for us, um, Deputy Mayor. And um, I know last year we did look at doing something like that and we didn't get a lot of uptake from um, residents or participants. Like there, there is a group um, of land, of homeowners who um, annually do clean up in front of their homes and on their roads and um, they're you know quite um, keen to keep doing that but as far as running a full-fledged event with it, um, it there wasn't a lot of uptake on that. Well I, I would suggest that circumstances have changed and, and there isn't a whole lot of Fair. other things going on and that is something that we maybe we should put a lot of time and effort into because I think there would be uptake. Uh, people are that's, out walking. That's a good point. They're they're out walking, uh, and they see the. Uh, I mean, we we rarely take a walk without taking a garbage bag with us, um, and I think it's an opportunity to clean up the town. Um, I question why we would spend uh, three thousand dollars in newsletters when. What are we advertising at this point? Um, our newsletters are that's um, you know what we put together at um, that's our portion of the newsletter that goes out each um, quarter. I think Andrew sends it out, and I see. Um, yeah, so we have to be we have to put our share in there. Okay. Uh, page 23 and 23B um, are the costs of operating the various parks. Uh, the notes to these pages uh, detail the, the capital works and reserve contributions. If there's no questions on 23, we can go to notes to 23. Fred? Yeah, I've got a question on uh, uh, page 23. The, the And Kim gave it to us in her last report that she wants the town to buy a utility vehicle and a trailer. And and I understand the, the need for that. Um, I still wished, I think it was John's suggestion that some arrangement could be made with the Mono Nordic Ski Club. They have an excellent vehicle, and I'm sure it's not used 365 days a year. But putting that aside, if you go to uh, your trail budget, Kim, and I'm 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 sorry, I'm scrolling as I talk. I'm looking where where are trails? You have the the um, you have the one behind the watermark uh, subdivision to be redone this year, I think for $25,000. Okay, and you've put that in your budget. I can't I can't find it. I don't, I don't know where trails are now. I've lost the page. Uh, but, to go um, on 23B, Fred, that's the detail 23. to the, the notes to 23. I'm sorry, yeah, notes I'm to 23. Okay, somewhere it says $25,000 for the trail behind uh, what the watermark subdivision. I, I don't think that's on 23B. My question actually, to you. Sorry, sorry, okay. just to correct you on that. That's not for that, just that one trail, though. That's, uh -huh. that's, 
that's a that twenty five five is made up of a number of different projects. Okay, here's here's my point. Sure. You were telling me one of the things that utility vehicle could be used for is rather than hire an outside contractor to do those trails to grade them or whatever they do, that we could have Dave drive the utility vehicle and he pull something behind it and he could grade those trails and it would save us a lot of money. My That's question or, or my point to you is this, is you've got both, well here I found it, 1281 trail maintenance, maintenance of motor trail, track services, Brookfield trail, $25,500. All right, if we don't have a utility vehicle, that's what it's gonna cost us to hire a contractor. If we have a utility vehicle, it isn't gonna cost us that much. So you, you shouldn't have both items in your budget. The, if we get the utility vehicle, you, that 25.5 should be reduced, I don't know, to zero or something. Well, I, under, I understand what you're saying there. So there's a portion of that. Um, so we have nine trails in total in Mono. I'm just gonna break it down for you so you know where the 25.5 came from. We have nine trails in Mono. Um, we annually budget $1,000 per trail um, for maintenance, which is, which is not a lot of money, but that's what we've done in the past and it seems to be working. So um, sticking with that $9,000, then there's um, $2,500 in there for the repair of two boardwalks that will be done in-house on the Menorah walking trails. Um, which are our responsibility. So there's two boardwalks out there that need to be replaced and Mono staff will look after that. Um, then there's $4,000 for new screenings um, on the Old Oak Lane Trail. The last time we did that was in um, 2015 at a cost of $2,500 and we need to do new screenings and vegetation removal on the watermark trail. And the last time we did that, the cost was approximately $8,000. So where we could cut back on money is in the 4,000 for the Old Oak Lane Trail and the 10,000 for the um, watermark trail because we could do it in-house, so those two the 4,010, I would say, could be cut at least by half. So from 14,000 down to 7,000. Another big area where we'll save money through purchasing a utility vehicle is on our baseball diamonds because we have to get our diamonds graded um, and dragged every year. Um, line, new limestone screenings put down to the tune of approximately $4,000 per diamond. If we had the utility vehicle, again, that would be something we could do in-house. Oh, okay, Kim, 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 I hear you. I can't keep all this math in my head. My question for you is simply, you've got the utility vehicle in your budget. Have mm -hmm. you reflected those savings in the numbers you're giving us? If, if I can do it very quickly in my head, so we would save four thousand dollars on baseball diamonds and we would save another seven so four plus seven is eleven thousand dollars in one year okay for my fellow counselors i'm now up to four hundred and thirteen thousand dollars in budget cuts <laughs> yeah, les can you did you get those numbers that kim gave you because i they go too fast oh. for me to know where they go on your budget. Oh. You, you know, put them in. As far as the the ball diamonds, that's another that's another line item which we'll get to. Uh, for the trail maintenance, uh, that was seven thousand dollar reduction. Uh, but it was under this budget. It was anticipated uh, for the for the trail signage that we got the grant in this year that the signs would be installed. Uh, under the trail budget in 2021. So we'll need to have some funds for that under this line. So I think the cost was approximately 5,000. Uh, if we're saving seven, I think the 25.5 can become 23.5.
And then as far as the ball diamonds go, uh, we'll go back to the main pages where they are located and reduce the cost there. Well, I keep trying. So if that if council is okay with that, the 25.5 becomes 23.5. And that, that just ensures uh, we have money somewhere in the budget to put in at least uh, the signs on the trails. Well, uh, through the chair, um, Kim, I, I understand through a conversation I had with Les, and I can't find it now, that the uh, somewhere in here is the uh, cost of installing the signs for the uh, uh, South Mono Trail System. I'm sorry, Count um, Councillor Mangton. Low, my I, I couldn't hear you very well. It was really choppy oh. there. Here, where is the cost for installing the uh, the signage that's going to be done next year? Right, so that, that's what I was just mentioning. Kim had a savings of 7000 in the 25.5, but we need about five for those signs. So really, we can only reduce that amount by two. This was anticipated somewhere in that 25.5, the signs for the trails would be installed. So oh. Kim's, Kim's total number is that five wasn't in there. So you're saying that's that, that that actual installation of the signage doesn't exist as a line item in this draft budget? It, it, it's it's included in that uh, trail maintenance number now, twenty three five. Okay, so is, that, is that clear, Ralph? Okay, I'm not sure. <clears throat> Did we lose Ralph altogether? Could you? No, I uh, I couldn't understand Kim. It was a very staccato, uh, completely yeah. broken up. Did everybody. Oh, yeah. better it's a, it's better? included. It's included with a total number. Is the problem? It's not listed separately. Okay. Is it under trail maintenance? That's uh, twelve eighty one. That's correct. Yes. So uh, we okay. reduced that amount uh, by a couple of thousand to uh, 23.5. And that, that would ensure right. uh, the signs get installed. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, back to the main budget page. Uh, maybe Kim could guide us where the savings are for the ball diamonds. Excuse they me. Have we, have we put to. To, to rest the issue of the uh, utility vehicle? I thought we did, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, because with the utility vehicle, there was a savings of 7,000 to the trails budget approximately before adding the sign installation. And then there's a further reduction in cost of grading the ball diamonds. Because then we yes. can now do it. Have we, have we fully explored the possibility of uh, sharing a, a vehicle with uh, Mono Nordic? Well, I can partly answer that. Okay, okay, Kim, go you're ahead. going again. Go. No, go ahead, Councillor Nick. Well, because I, I sort of wear two hats, being a member of Mono Nordic and doing trail maintenance there. I know Kim has talked to them. In fact, the, one of the persons she talked to may be on the screen right now. And we didn't. she didn't get a very favorable response from Mono Nordic about sharing their vehicle. Um, I, as a member of Mono Nordic, am a bit surprised by that. It's a, they have a, a great vehicle. We, we were using it. I, I've been out on trail maintenance uh, two days now, and that's a great little vehicle they've got. Um, you would think somewhere they could find, I don't know, 25 or 30 days a year when they could tell the town of Mono that we could use it for our trail maintenance. Um, I think the town of Mono has been pretty good to Mono Nordic. We. We excuse them on the development charges for the building. We Ooh. well, not not this year, but we give them the uh, pavilion for the school program without uh, any rental cost. Um, I, I would have thought they could have sat down and found out. I mean, the town of Mono ballpark. How many days a year would you need that vehicle to do trail maintenance? That's probably done in July and August. 
it couldn't be more than, I don't know, you couldn't need it more than 25, 30 days a year, if that. Um, well, I, di I did, let me just see here. I, I, just for council's information, I did put a few notes together as to some of the things we did on trails this year. Um, so there's just to start off with, there's the monthly inspections of all trails that we do. So there's nine trails out there and we do inspect them monthly. Um, we cut brush overgrowth at the Shelley Anderson and the 1926 track. We spent approximately um, three to four days on each one of those. We removed overgrowth at the west end of the Shelley Anderson. We repaired a gate at Shelley Anderson removed graffiti from boardwalk on the orange trail um, at Menorah, repaired two boardwalks on the yellow trail, repaired West Bridge at Main Pond. And I mean, this goes on and on and on. I could read this whole thing to you. I think what I'm trying to let you know is there's a lot more trail maintenance going on out there than um, um, you are uh, you're thinking does. That the trails are getting used so well um and there's always things going on out there to say 25 to 30 days i think is a very 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 um um minimalistic thought that that's all we would need it i i, I don't doubt that there's trail work going on uh inspection can be done on foot um and i have some real difficulty with this item in the budget when we have not totally exhausted the possibility of an arrangement with Mono Nordic. Absolutely, inspections can be done on foot. That's what we've been doing so far. Um, they take a lot of time considering the amount of trails that we do have to, to look at, like how long the trails are. This would certainly increase the efficiency of the inspections. Okay, hey, Ralph. Um, I, I support this uh, purchase, um, John. I think you're, you're you're quite right. It could be shared, but um, it, it's not going to be available when you want it if you're trying to share it with the Moon and Nordic. And I think that Kim will be pleasantly surprised at how and how often they can use this to their benefit. These vehicles are extremely useful. Um, I, I have one on my farm, and um, it's like a motorized uh, wheelbarrow. You can do so many things with it that you uh, couldn't couldn't do otherwise. So I think it's going to be a very the thirteen thousand is a very very uh, <clears throat> a good price for the amount of work you're going to get out of it for the next. Uh, 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 10, 20 years. I have one question for Kim. Um, you're going to want to move this around, isn't it? You're not going to be kept at one place. Do you have a, a flatbed trailer that you can uh, drive this up onto and take it off to another uh, trail system? Um, we've looked at a couple of options there. One is we can buy, um, we can purchase a, a small trailer to pull behind um, the work truck and they're approximately um, they're just under two thousand dollars to to purchase one of those or in a pinch um, we could use the ramps that we presently use to get the snow blower on the back of the truck we could um, use those to get it onto the back of the truck we would have to take the toolbox off it's not ideal um, it would mean that every time that we put the vehicle on the truck we would have to take the toolbox off of the truck and I'm, no, you, I you, am you, not sure how easy you, that's done, but that is an option. I, I thought we yeah, heard you, last time that it was inclusive of the price. Last time I gave you a price, I believe, of approximately $16,000, which included the trailer, okay. included tax, all of that. I've now reduced that so that because there was a comment about um, the cost of um, another vehicle, and I just wanted to show you that this vehicle is is no more expensive than others that have been purchased um Fair enough. such as by the ski club okay any other questions on this seeing none 
Okay, Les. Uh, does council have any questions on page 23 regarding uh, general maintenance of Corpa Hill Park, Mono College Park, Mono Center Park, and then the trail systems we just discussed? Les, if I can just jump in there, that's where you're going to save a bit of money through the utility vehicle is at Mono College Park and Mono Center Park. Okay, uh, what line to Mono College? Hang on, I'm just going to get there. So we would save approximately $4,000 between Mono College 1259 and Mono Center 1259 for the dragging of the baseball diamonds. We normally pay $4,000 per diamond to have that done. And um, we would be now doing it in house instead of having a contractor do it. So um, there would be some in-house labor and there'd be the supplies for the limestone, but 2000 would be sufficient for each park. So there's saving of, of $4,000 there. That's Mono College and Mono Center and Mono, and Mono Center Park as well. Yes. So, so Kim, if I could just jump in, the, the four thousand there, and the seven thousand on the earlier page, you, you've basically paid for that utility vehicle in one, in one year. year. Yeah, that's correct. And that's and those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. So uh, moving to page 23B, that uh, includes the Lloyd Armstrong Park, Island Lake Family Park, Medill Meadows Park, and a uh, new item for 2021, the Phil Stone Parkette. The capital detail for the parks, uh, page 23B. Now the large item um, under Island Lake is the park development. Uh, for 2020, we included the Philstone Park yet, as it was not a separated park yet. Uh, if you look down, we now have an item category for Philstone Park. Uh, the 527.7 is part of the Island Lake Park development. And then Philstone Works are as listed uh, below. And uh, all these works, as was budgeted in 2020, uh, being financed uh, between Park and Lou and, and mostly in this case would be development charges, as this is a new park development. Okay, I, I had a question on this, Les. Okay. Um, but I can't quite find my numbers. Some place on the Fieldstone Parkette, I don't know where it was, it, it was showing that we had to do $10,000 for landscaping and I don't know, $10,000 for something else, but I don't know what page okay. that yeah, was on. You go, yeah, so it's on the page 23B, the notes if you go a few lines down, Fieldstone Parkette has its own listing for capital. Yeah, but, th but that's my question because here it shows capital at $33,800. Right, so 10,000 so 10, of that is going to the, the new Philstone Park Reserve. So we can start, you know, reserving for future, for like the actual uh, park equipment down the road. And then 23.8, uh, Kim could give you more details, is some around the park, the landscaping, some seating and the pathway. Those, those are items, yes, those are items that were listed in the original um, tender document that um, have not been done yet. Like I believe, I grab my notes for that. There's, um, I believe it's $9,000 for seating. Um, here we are. I have given them to you right now. Mm. 
it, it, it's okay if there's an explanation. I, I, I'm happy. Yeah. I just I couldn't add it up right, and I saw that the two ten thousand dollar amount. When I get to this page, it's thirty three thousand eight hundred. If, if 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 there's a logical explanation, I'll accept it. It is. There's there's nothing extra in there, um, and there's just, there's just the ten thousand um, dollars for the landscaping to be carried over from that was originally in the Island Lake park tender so it's just basically putting it into now the right park if there's no further questions on that uh, page 24 a couple lines uh basically the 2021 uh Budget of 551.5. The contribution from development charges pays in total the the two works at Island Lake and then the pathway at the Philstone Park. At page 25, uh, the budget for uh, the Moral Center Community Center. And again, uh, looking down to the revenues uh, for 2020. Th those are the actual revenues that came in before the closure of 4,900 approximately. If there's any chance of somewhat of an opening next year, uh, we're budgeting just below half what we budgeted in 2020 of approximately 15,000 for revenues. And again, that's dependent on if we can open up the halls safely. There's notes to page 25 on the capital. Yes. Yep, sorry. If I could, and this, this comment applies to both the uh, Menorah and uh, Mono Center. Um, you have um, attributed salaries, benefits, and, and various costs to each of these facilities as if it's business as usual, when in fact it's far from it. Uh, they're dark for the most part. So why are we, uh, why are we attributing costs when in fact, arguably, we may have savings. Now, it's not to say that those those uh, salaries and so forth don't show up somewhere else. But is it is it accurate to uh, to uh, attribute salaries as an example to the operation of facilities that are currently dark? Uh, well, the salaries and benefits, uh, as you can see, there is a reduction in the projected year end of. Uh, approximately ten thousand dollars for the salaries those salaries would include any works around the building for example any landscaping gardening that kind of thing uh, also uh, if there are any uh, uh, stat holidays in that uh, because the original salary amount for stat holidays or vacations uh, were budgeted in this line item that would include uh, items like that as well now, of course, the hall was open for the first three months, so we do have salaries uh, for operations at the beginning of the year. And basically that applies, like you said, to, to both halls. Council wants to move to the notes to page 25. Basically, the, uh, the capital works. One, one project Kim is proposing is replacing the cabinets of 34,000. Uh, the cost of that project you see below uh, is coming from the uh, Model Center Renovations Reserve. Uh, the other items are contributions to, to the various reserves. No, that's it. Moving on to Menorah Park Pavilion. Uh, again, this, the same comment when it comes to, to the revenue. The projected 2020 revenue of 10855 uh, We actually did get them. Again, that's at the beginning of the year. 
uh, hoping some kind of opening and budgeting just under half for hall rental. Um, the capital detail are on the notes to, to page 26. A uh, couple of key projects, uh, $20,000 uh, for the roof replacement and uh, 21300 for the retaining walls and drainage. Uh, we're pulling 38700 from the reserve to help offset the cost of those two projects. Uh, there's also staining the building of 8000 and the uh, fridge replacement did not happen this year. I mean, with the hall closed, so there's no no need for it. Uh, it's been rebudgeted for 2021. Okay, if there's no questions there. Uh, page 27 is the library. Uh, the number detail uh, are, are in the notes. Bulk of that number for Madam Orangeville, Mayor. Orangeville user fees. Yeah, just a sec. If I may, if, oh, I'm sorry. If I I may declare, sorry, Madam Mayor, if I may declare an interest in the uh, uh, contribution to uh, the Orangeville Public Library as my uh, spouse works there. Um, does that make me do I have to turn off the <laughs> sound and volume at that point but I, I usually I, make that. I, I think you're fine John we'll just uh, make note of that in the minutes that uh, as you've done in the past uh, yeah no no real surprise there obviously uh, reduced amount for 2020 in the projected uh, and then re-budgeting the same amount uh, in 2021 for the user fees uh, from the Orangeville Library. The other two libraries are pretty consistent costing. Okay. And of course we get the annual grant of 10202 towards the library and that amount's been the same as far back as 1990. And uh, and it's a real pain to fill in the government website to, to get it, but um, <laughs> you get it. Page 28, uh, planning and zoning. Uh, a little bit of saving in the, uh, in the, uh, the salary line. Again, as council is aware of the retirement of a staff person than a replacement. Uh, the replacement is at a lower grade. Plus we had the vacancy of uh, about a month. So uh, for 2021 budgeting, it does translate into uh, $10,000 saving. Planning fees were uh, projected to, uh, to be a bit down, projecting the same for 2021 of 38,000. I'm going to go back up to the special projects line of 1280. That basically the bulk of that cost is the Greenwood Herring. You want to go to notes to page page 28. We'll give you the detailed breakdown. So the planning hearings we had budgeted 400,000 uh, projecting of 200 and uh, that is the Greenwood hearing and the big saving uh, is because the hearing didn't go as long as we originally thought would when we budgeted for this amount. It ended, if memory correct, sometime in September. And, that, and that's one of the reasons uh, we did have a small surplus because even though we had the loss in revenue uh, of 400000 in total, uh, we had a $200,000 saving in this category. For 2021, uh, there's several hearings uh, budget. 
Dave might want to jump in on this. Half that 200 is 100,000 uh, is to finish off any greenwood if there's a, an appeal or, or whatever. And then there's two smaller commercial developments that we may have uh, uh, an appeal and go to a hearing. And of course, the numbers below show part, part of the, those hearing costs being financed from, uh, from planning reserves. The zoning update uh, did about 10,000 for 2020. That's 10,000 being financed from development charges as that is an expenditure under the DC. And then the balance finishing off in 2021, again, 95,000 uh, financed 100% uh, from development charges. There's no questions there. We'll move on to the last item on the budget, forestry, and basically for next year, nothing happened this year, nothing's happening next year. Other than we are continuing on uh, with the tree program, which has been very successful over, over the years. Okay, Fred. Um, yeah, now that we've been through it, and I don't know what your numbers are now, $1,090,000, or if they've obviously dropped by somewhat, but I'd like to go back. Uh, I if had I sent could, out an email. I'm Sorry. just going to go back and make that change, Councillor Mangtalone, regarding the pollinator garden from three to zero. Would you like an updated number, uh, Fred? Well, no, let me tell you, you can in a minute. I'll tell you the, the big, big picture thought I had. And I did send out uh, an email to my fellow counselors, and I, I CC'd you on it, that I, I, I know in total, without looking at the changes we've made today, we were going to put $1.9 million into reserves this year. And the thought I had is uh, that that's a, that's a lot for our taxpayers to bear. Um, why don't we, like some other municipalities do, why don't we get a loan and pay for some of our capital projects? I was thinking of things like that greater at $625,000. And I made a few inquiries. Uh, we could actually get a loan at 1.02% for five year an amortized loan. But then Ralph Manchelo, who's who's much older and smarter than I am, phoned me this afternoon and, and uh, and he said, you know, why should we borrow money when we're still putting all this money into reserves, which are earning basically almost nothing in interest? Uh, why don't we just for this year cut down somewhat on the amount we're putting into some of our reserves? And, and I think Ralph made a really good suggestion. That is better than borrowing money. So I'm wondering if we go back up to the reserve page, uh, which I can't quickly find because I can't scroll that fast that if, if, if we could look at some of the money we're putting into reserves. We've already agreed that we don't have to put the $400,000 into the blind line reserve. Uh, I'm wondering about things like the Purple Hill Reserve. Now, I know you're listening. There, there's some guesswork here. Uh, we're, we're thinking we're going to have to replace or redo some of those concrete slabs that we didn't do two years ago. But it's, it's so hard to know when and at what cost. Um, in talking it over with Ralph when he phoned me today with his suggestion, the thought was this, if we could reduce the amount we put into reserves this year to keep the overall budget increase down to a reasonable level, and then let's say five, six, seven years out from here, we do find that, oh, we've hit something and we hadn't built up enough reserves to pay for it. Well, that would be then the time to take out a loan. Uh, okay, so so it, to, to, to get the budget down to where we want less, can we go back to that reserve page and consider uh, some yeah. items? I don't know what council sees, but I have the page up. The page. Oh, do you? TV. Okay, I'm I was trying to find it. Wearing my budget. Yeah, I'm still scrolling. <laughs> page 16. All right, uh, so you've chopped out the. F Let me go back to where you're showing it. You've chopped out the, the four hundred thousand. So it's now zero. Okay. What about? Um, the purple, the purple hill, uh, where we were. Purple Hill Roads. Whoops, I just lost it. Purple Hill Roads Reserve. We're thinking to put a hundred thousand 
dollars into it this year, which will bring it up to 400,000. What if we simply robbed that reserved and put it into in, into our operating budget, the whole the whole 400,000? Between that and the blind line reserve, there, there's there's eight or eight hundred thousand dollars right there of the of the one million and ninety thousand dollars we're looking for. Okay, I put it out as a suggestion, Les. You're, you 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 have well, been just, me. Yeah, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, if, if council supports that that suggestion, I, I could. I mean, we'll leave the hundred in. I mean, we're contributing it this year. I like to keep our line item in so for future budgeting council can see that we were budgeting a reserve contribution to it, and then in the finance cap, I would take out four hundred. So basically putting in one, but taking out four. So the net effect is 300,000. So if council is good with that, I could put in the 400. I, I might not have followed you quite on that list, but, but anyways, Alex, do you, want, do you want to weigh in here? I'm suggesting the 400 go out. Ralph, were you wanting to add? Well, yes, yeah, sorry. Along the same line, Fred has stolen my thunder, but you've done it better than I could. Oh, thank you, Fred. Um, I, I, th I think this is a good approach. Um, you know, normally, we wouldn't do this. Uh, we would uh, continue to build up our, our reserves as we've done um, in, in the past, and, and I've supported the idea. Um, Fred has, has uh, a number of times that we have we you know, as the uh, uh, people who are taking advantage of uh, our, uh, shall we say, our, our particularly our bridges and things like that for the next 50 years should be paying for them rather than uh, ourselves right now. Uh, but it's still, it's I can't see I can't see our treasurer um, being the first treasurer who uh, led us into debt. And I don't think um, that's a, that's that's the image that, that Les wants. I, I appreciate anyway, that. I would, <laughs> thanks. I, I would prefer to uh, to not make additions to uh, our reserves and recognize that this is an unusual time. You know, heck, we're we're a million dollars short, and our budget is about two million dollars less than it was uh, previously. So we, we need. It's a time when we can do different things to try and be. Uh, Innovative, uh, and um, the whole uh, the whole objective here, but the big objective is is to not raise our, our taxes to keep our our, ta our our increase at one at one percent. So the other things that I would suggest if people went along with this concept would be roadway resurfacing. I think you, you alluded to that, Fred. Um, that's um, uh, related to the concrete, uh, I, I believe, in Purple Hill. Um, we don't really know when that's going to have to be. Um, more is going to have to be done, and there's also roads unexpected costs. Both of those are sixty thousand dollars, and I'm wondering if we could remove those. But I'd be happy with Matt's um, uh, input in that. And the other, the other issue that uh, Purple Hill, you know, not Purple, oh Purple Hill Roads Reserve um, removed the hundred thousand dollars. Now, uh, removing the hundred. Now, is council also wanting to use the balance of the three hundred that's left? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm repeating what Fred said. Yes, sir. we wanted to remove oh, that. Is correct. Okay, so yeah. the hundred. I'm not sure if you see my screen. The hundred becomes a zero. Highlighted in red, not to lose track of it. And then we're using three hundred. So, so Les, what's the bottom line look like now with those those massive changes that we just made? Okay, well, let Can me you... make these entries. <laughs> make the two sixties too. Yeah, right. And then you you mentioned the the one seventy. Road, roads unexpected. Yeah. Unex unexpended. Yes, unexpended. <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> But he, but, but Les, he said he didn't say to use that reserve. He said take the sixty thousand dollar contribution out. Uh, no, that one is an in and out. 
because we put the 60,000 back into it from the solar panels. Oh. Okay. So, so I mean, it makes no difference. You take it out, uh, so you put yeah, it in one yeah. person, it all works out. Yeah. Okay, so I let, me get back, let me get back to the budget and just do all these changes. So we'll start with page 13. The roadway reserve. For resurfacing sixty thousand, that now is zero. Purple Hill one hundred thousand is now zero. And then, if I don't lose my train of thought, to page seventeen, we're now going to use the Purple Hill Reserve, the balance of it, of three hundred. So let me, before I go into the unexpended, let me see where we sit at. Okay, we're at 218, so I will use the unexpended. We used actually that reserve last year. We budgeted 295 out of it. So that brings us down to 44,333. Can I make a suggestion? The 1% increase that we said you we could put in our taxes increased by 80,000. What if we go one and a half percent? There's your extra 40,000 right there, or 44,000, right? Correct. Did you follow me on that? Madam Mayor? Yes. I was going to suggest that rather than try to make a decision here and now, staff be given the opportunity to go back and find a way of arriving at 1%. Now, I know it's only a small amount at this point, but I think amongst themselves, they can probably find that, that money quite readily. I do not want to go above 1%. Um, and I think that uh, the, the the residents need an opportunity to digest this budget, which they're seeing in detail for the first time tonight. And uh, we should be uh, we should be giving staff a chance to to, to come to the, the conclusion that we uh, we thought was a good one uh, a couple of weeks ago. And rather than trying to uh, tie a bow around this tonight. Madam Mayor, I think that's a fair suggestion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we usually come back the second meeting uh, in November to, to finalize the budget anyways. Some things we even have to have a special meeting, but at this point I think we can finalize it at the second meeting in November with a staff suggestion to eliminate the 44333. Okay, um, I think that's a good uh, direction to take. Uh, Fred, did you want to say anything further? No, that's okay. I was just saying I, I would be prepared if they couldn't find it to go for one and a half percent. But I, I, not that I disagree with John's suggestion that staff can do that. But. I think it's a very Yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, I, I was just going to say something in defense of borrowing. Um, I, I don't want Les to 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 uh, to have that on his uh, on his uh, list of accomplishments that he took us into debt, either. However, if we had to borrow for something like the greater, uh, we would be accomplishing Fred's um, uh, dream of of spreading the cost forward as opposed to putting it all on the backs of. Uh, of uh, current residents, um, and there's no better time to borrow. I mean, the the, the rates, uh, according to um, Infrastructure Ontario, are a fraction above one percent. If we had to borrow uh, towards something that was going to give us uh, 10, 15, 20 years of of uh, use, 
I think that would be a good thing. So I don't think we should we should uh, rule it out entirely. Okay. Um, any other comments on that idea? Should we ask staff to bring back that uh, adjustment also? Okay. For consideration? Sorry, Your Honor, I'm not sure what you mean by that adjustment. So in other words, the, the cost for the grader would be a loan as opposed to uh, coming out of reserves. All right. Uh, can, I, can I make a comment, Madam Mayor? Yes. Um, not 100% against uh, borrowing, but when there's funds available for a project to use, uh, I think we should use them for that purpose. Uh, so again, in this case, the equipment reserve. If Council had a project uh, that there was not enough reserve amount, then I think that would be the timing to borrow because the money is not not in place to, to finance a project. For example, say the Council decided to build, to build an outdoor pool. Obviously, we have no funds for that. Perfect project to borrow for generations down the road. Uh, that, that would be my call. Plus, when you do borrow, you know, 1%, 2%, you, you have more than the cost of the interest annually, uh, $600,000 greater over, say, five, six years, you still have to pay a principal amount back as well. So basically, you, you're committed to a minimum of over $100,000 a year coming out of your budget versus, well, we have the money to buy a greater, maybe we'll save our money and not buy the greater this time. But once you finance it, you're now stuck paying for it. And I, and I agree. Now, if you have to borrow, there's no better time than uh, at this time. But I would suggest uh, next year is another budget year and uh, talking to Will McKay at CNBC with Gundy, he projects these interest rates will continue into 22-23, 2022-2023, uh, only because the government has adopted pretty much what the U.S. is doing, an average inflation rate of 2%. And by average, that means even if the inflation rate goes above 2%, because inflation was so below uh, over the past year, like just under 1%, they're just averaging it out. So the rates will continue to stay low, at least for the next couple of years. So I, I would use the loan tool perhaps in next year's budget if need be. Okay. So we we still have the information to come back to uh, the next meeting, less, And uh, that's uh, not the 17th, but the 24th. Right. And so at that time, we can also review the loan concept and maybe some other ideas come up in the meantime. So if everybody is um, prepared for that, then if you want to continue on with the agenda, or do you want a break for 10 minutes, or what's the will? Yes, Fred. I'd like a break for five minutes. Okay, is everybody all right with that? Yes, okay. Okay, so five minutes, so we'll see you back here at uh, 9.55 p.m.
for some of my russet applesauce and trying yeah. to give me something in exchange. <laughs> okay, well, let's reconvene. So now we're on to item two, ICIP, the COVID-19 Resilience Infrastructure Stream. So Mark has forwarded the information to us. Uh, did you want to add anything, Mark? Your Worship, you've jumped to number three. Actually, number two is the Hockley Historic Community Hall and Church. Well, my agenda says it's the other way around. So I guess well, wow. okay, gave me the wrong thing. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm easy either way. Which one do you want me to deal with? <laughs> well, the, the, the infrastructure funding is probably fairly simple to deal with. It came in. Uh, as you can see in the afternoon of Friday, just when we were trying to get to the, the budget out with less changes in it. So I think it's a good news story. Uh, we, uh, well, I mean, I thought it was gonna be more when the feds announced it. This is the funding that was announced uh, probably three months ago. Uh, and it's just coming forward now. So we, we've been uh, granted $100,000, it's a maximum. Uh, certainly the park is, is a project that is worth uh, submitting for funding. It's, it's uh, uh, more or less uh, shovel ready. The plants are there ready to go. So we could certainly submit that as our project um, and uh, utilize uh, either the 100,000 for that project or even the uh, additions or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the uh, uh, other projects within the park that you may not, may not have got to with the budget you had. So, um, provisional, I, provisional. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you so that that is certainly an option of of uh, applying for that. Or if there were no other provisional work you wanted to do, was to then uh, uh, save some of the reserves that you are putting towards it. So, uh, Fred, question. Um, yeah, are you, is less going to work? Okay, we, I, I can't find the numbers. We have to pay 20%, right? Is, is less going to work this possible grant into the next version of the budget? The max we're going to get from this is 100,000. We haven't got a project approved, right? So we still got to apply for the project. So I, 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 I'd hate to be applying for something that we then don't get. Right, so so I, I I'm thinking if 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 we if we make application for the park, you do have the provisional uh, items that you can look at, or you can put back into re parkland reserves uh, monies that that uh, you've you've got from that. So I think that's that's the approach that I I, I think would be prudent at this time. Okay, so Ralph, I think that putting that into the park is a great great idea. Uh, I, I'm really nervous about uh, what we're going to come in with in the budget for next year uh, uh, when we do RFPs for the uh, Island Lake Park, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to need some money there, so I, I support that. Okay, so this uh, uh, would have to be in by December 21st, 2020 for one project? Uh, yes, and we can, but we can't even look at it until the 16th. Okay. Of Sorry. Okay. So we will do that. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right. So the request from the Hockley Community Hall and Church for uh, support. And uh, the uh, I did talk with the mayor from Agla Toss, who did uh, confirm that they were uh, supporting this group with a thousand dollars in 2020 and they were going to be going through the budget process for 2021 and would be considering the same amount uh, in that budget year so uh, what is the wish of council how much do you want to have it uh, what's the line item for the budget for 21 well, um, I know we just dealt with the draft budget, and I can't e even remember if there was an item in there for donations for 2021, but could we just consider this an early request out of our 2021 budget for a donation? Les? Uh, I was just going to say, uh, Fred, it's under Council Line 1269. 
$6,600 for a year and projected it's higher than that. I rebutted $6,600 again for 2021. Uh, outside of, outside the DC donation that we did for the ski club, uh, council donated just over two thousand dollars. So in the six to six hundred dollars, uh, there's money available there. So why why don't why don't we right now agree to give them a thousand dollars out of the twenty twenty one donations budget? Okay, uh, so we should put that in the form of a motion. Um, Mark, or? Um, sorry, I'm just thinking whether you would just do it when you dealt with your donation requests. Okay, so just hold this over so we, it could come back in the new year when we are going through that process. You want to tell them that you've added it to your donations list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know $1,000 is accounted for already. Right. So if everybody's comfortable with that, I will contact uh, Janice and just let her know that that's being proposed. Okay. So is there is there yep. um, is there a target date for dealing with that? Because they, I think they were fairly anxious to to get an answer from us, and and probably more anxious to get a donation if at all possible. Mm hmm. In previous years, we've done it about March, but we can up that if we want to do it a little earlier um, or just knock off one and still solicit for other donations uh, for roughly the March time frame. And I am uh, I had to change my room, but uh, so I don't have the agenda or the, the original letter in front of me, but what were they looking for? Anything. Anything. <laughs> yeah, because the roof is needing repair they have reserves to fix the roof but um, their concerns uh, are their ongoing 400 and change uh, costs each month uh, so they just need some help to get through until they can start using the facilities again well I, I could be supportive of advancing them the the thousand and revisiting the the issue as part of our uh, donations consideration early in January or, or February at the latest. Okay. So how's the rest of council feel? Do you want to consider this in January? First thing? Yes, Ralph? I think that's a good thing. I'm not sure what John meant by advance some money now. I don't think we want to do that. Um, they uh, do have an expense of almost 500 a month and they're getting a thousand from edge toss so they may be tied over until january and if we can come up with the money in january I, I would, i'm guessing that it would be a appropriate timing for them yeah so if well, everybody if, if they can do the schedule i'm fine with that okay if so they're I, getting the money from toss right yeah. away right Okay, so I, I will contact Janice and explain the situation and when to expect uh, our donation. And uh, so now we're on to the motion uh, put forward by uh, the mayor regarding the third line parking. Um, and how do you want to proceed with this? Um, we, uh, Mark and I did talk with Sylvia Jones today is bringing the issue up with the minister and um, she understands the concerns that we have and is looking for some resolution uh, whether or not we uh, do tandem uh, no parking that kind of thing on those sections of roads like we the county did for the Hockley Road to, and that parking lot or uh, we find out from the minister whether or not staff is able to reconfigure an area to expand their parking lot and make it more accessible. So um, that is in the hopper. Um, yes, John? I think it's got to be a combination of, of things. Um, they're not going to make the parking lot large enough to accommodate the kinds of, of um, situations that uh, are ongoing. I, I mean, I drove it on Saturday and it was a, it was a, 
an absolute horror show. Yeah. Um, and the parking lot was completely full. Um, my objective in, in giving staff input on it was to get some advice as to which which side would work better from the standpoint of the stability of the shoulder as an example. But it could be that we, we end up considering uh, a parking prohibition on both sides of the road uh, for a distance north and south of the entrance to the uh, parking lot. Um, but I, I'm happy to, to, I think the motion contemplates if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and again, I don't have my agenda in front of me, um, I think it contemplates a staff report and uh, also um, some discussion of the feasibility of uh, provincial offence officers doing the enforcement uh, as opposed to the OPP. Not to say that the OPP couldn't do it, um, but I think that if we had uh, a couple of people and we could certainly um, have our um, roads, the people who do the roads, to, um, uh, inspe uh, inspection or, or um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, they, they they could be delegated to be provincial offense uh, officials and hand out uh, part one tickets. I just don't want to see uh, police re resources uh, uh, on mm -hmm. that way. It could be done cheaper and more efficiently. Okay. Mark? I was just going to say that's one of the issues we did raise with Sylvia today, Deputy Mayor Krillman, uh, and that was to, uh, with their own conservation officers who who have the ability to ticket. And if they're there at the front of their driveway anyway, seeing people go by, they're 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 certainly able to take that on. And Syl Sylvia didn't disagree, um, and she she was going to take all of that information back. And just so Council's aware, we did follow up. Uh, or I sent emails out to the park superintendent. I did get one email back last week confirming that she's received our uh, correspondence. She said she'd get back to me last week as to which council meeting she would like to come to. Um, she has not given me a date yet. I don't know whether that's uh, um, what that is, whether that's internal or not, but uh, Sylvia was also gonna take that back to Minister Yurik to uh, uh, encourage their staff to uh, at attend a council meeting uh, as soon as possible. Certainly the Parks Ontario people could be uh, in a position to hand out uh, tickets, but I wouldn't count on it in as much as I haven't seen one in years, frankly. Yeah. So your motion, John, that staff report back to council at its next meeting on the practicality of prohibiting parking on one side of the third line in proximity of the Mono Cliffs Park parking lot entrance, as well as the possibility of appointing and or hiring provincial offense officers to enforce our parking bylaw. Could I make a small amendment uh, on one side or both sides? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so that's moved by Creelman and do I have a seconder? Seconded by Nix. And is there any further discussion? Okay, Being none, yeah. anyone is opposed? Okay, that's carried. So we will run through Schedule A. Ralph, did you have anything on Schedule A? Uh, nothing, Your Honor. Okay. Fred, do you have anything? You're saying no. Sharon, did you have anything? Uh, just a, a quick remark about uh, uh, the Cook letter. I've gone to the letter now, so I don't know which it was. Is that number one? Uh, and sure. uh, feel their pain with garbage that they've been picking up. And um, this is a. I don't. I don't know what the step is to. Uh, stop this from happening but it's all over mono you've got speeding but you've also got people throwing out garbage it includes a whole bag of recyclable i mean really that that's you know yeah. so we did, we did talk with uh Sylvia about those issues also the other personal okay. uh, fences that are happening and people in cars and whatever um and she said that uh they had gone through a lot of this at the bell fountain area and uh you know so it's it's just uh, something that's happened due to covid 
people are just getting out and they've forgotten their manners, they've forgotten the rules of the road, they've forgotten a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, it is a, a valid uh, question as to whether or not the COVID protocols are even being uh, followed, you know. Oh. So we just have to just take everything one step at a time and uh, try to get some traction to getting some of these issues solved. Uh, John, did you have anything on Schedule A? Uh, no, I don't, but a very quick question. Does Mono even have a, a littering bylaw? Uh, yeah. That, yep. We do? Do we? Um, Fred Simpson or Mark Early? I mean, I know the one that we've got is the clean yards bylaw that we are yeah. trying to establish. Yeah. Does that cover it, 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 they've gone to sleep, Your Worship. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having <laughs> computer issues. I've got it up. Um, okay. We certainly do for we certainly do for our parks, um, and I'm pretty sure we do for the rest of the municipality. But I will confirm that and get something out to you. I've, okay. I've got the policy behind me. I probably have it in the next ten minutes. Okay. And anything else, John? No, I'm fine until reports. Okay, and Sharon? Uh, just to that, we we don't certainly don't have any signs entering Mono that say that we have a uh, littering bylaw and you're going to be in trouble if you do it. Maybe another thing to consider. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so if there's nothing further on Schedule A, that we accept Schedule A to this agenda, could I have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Krillman. Anyone opposed? That's carried. Okay, so reports of staff and council members. Um, so let's see, Les, do you have any anything else that you wanted to talk about except for the budget? Uh, nope, um, I'm done for the evening, Madam Mayor. Well, thank, thank you, you very much for your energy. <laughs> Kim, do you have anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, just one very quick item, and that's to let Council know that um, I've, uh, staff have been investigating the feasibility of converting or retrofitting the old bathroom or the um, shelter beside the gazebo at Menorah um, into possibly putting a one um, in there as opposed to having the porta potty to I don't know if council remembers but at one time that used to be a um, um, a washroom facility when we had uh, overnight um, camping at Menorah so we have um, done some investigating we have found the old well we found the old septic and I'm happy to let you know that we had water running today out there and um, found out that the septic works as well so it looks like if council wants to go ahead with that um, once I get the numbers all in and find out whether or not I have to follow accessibility um, rules um, there is the possibility of um, staff putting in a bathroom out there so okay well we look forward to your report back okay okay uh, David Pratman There you are. Um, um, <laughs> hello, Fred. Uh, yes, I've got broadband here for sure. It works. Um, no, really, I don't. I'm preparing for next council meeting, the 17th, and a lot on my plate for that. Yeah, it's going to be a busy one. Okay, so um, Matt Donor, did you have anything that you wanted to update us with? No, I don't think so. Just uh, maybe a quick note. Uh, SCADA is going pretty well. They got uh, Cardinal Woods the first couple of days of this changeover there to the new system is going reasonably well. And uh, yeah, that's about it for now. Okay. And uh, Fred Simpson, do you have anything you wanted to update? Yeah, just a couple of things, Your Worship. Um, the uh, Roma 2021 conference is January 25th and 26th, and the deadline to uh, make requests for delegations is November 30th. Uh, and I bring that up in part 
because it'll it could impact our 2021 council meeting schedule if uh, um, members of council uh, plan on taking in the uh, conference. It's going to be a virtual conference, of course, this year. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I've got a uh, tentative schedule for council meetings next year, but my questions are, does council want to continue on with alternating day and night council meetings uh, on the assumption that we're going to be uh, still doing virtual meetings? probably for the bulk of 2021. Any comments? Yes, Sharon? I'll just put my vote in for alternating. Okay, Fred? I can go either way, either way. Okay, Ralph? Your mic? Your mic? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I, I can go either, either way as well, but at, at this particular hour of 10.15, I, I have to tell you, I'm not at my best. And morning meetings, if you want me to be sharp, as Fred thinks I should be, uh, I prefer morning meetings. Well, it's interesting that the, the county did switch to afternoon meetings, and even the committees are, are all squashed into one day and they're all held during the day but at the same time they are recorded and available for viewing so uh john uh probably alternating but i i could live with uh, with uh, daytime but i'd yeah. prefer alternating yeah well i'm just wondering in terms of because i have to travel to the office in order to get broadband and so does fred uh, if there would be consideration through the months of January and February that we did hold daytime meetings until such yeah. time things have changed, maybe, if there's a God. <laughs> and uh, and the, the worst of the winter is over, and then we could go back to alternating if that is possible. Yep. Sharon? Yep, that's a great idea. So that's with that... In Okay, so it, with that in mind, then, Fred Simpson, if you can uh, try to m manipulate the calendar for January and February. Uh, in terms of Roma, uh, whether or not we have a delegation, they would definitely be uh, during the day. I don't think there's any evening delegations. So, you know, we might, we may have to. Uh, um, if, if we decide there is something that we want to have us uh, looking at delegation. Well, we do, uh, we do have uh, a couple of groups that are looking to schedule um, delegations. So if we could uh, sort out at least the January, so the 26th meeting uh, would of course fall during the Roma schedule. Last year, we pushed that meeting off by one week. So I'm, uh, of course, we're getting late in the month. So I would consider changing the second meeting in January so it doesn't fall during Roma. And if, if that oh. works for council, then I can I'll publish that or send so, it to you at the dates. Okay, so Roma is a Monday, Tuesday? Yeah, Roma's the 25th and 26th of January. So maybe the uh, if everybody on council is available on the Wednesday, the Thursday, John and I would have uh, county committees. So we don't have Wednesday that week that would be available. If so, if we're, if we're in in the process of wanting to either attend virtually or do a delegation virtually, that's going to conflict. So. Maybe what we need to do as individuals is to get our mind around whether or not we want to register for the conference and if there's anything that we want to delegate to a minister about. So, so if you start penciling that together, Fred, and then maybe for, uh, well, maybe we could take a minute on the 17th to have a, an offline discussion about how we want to work that, if there is any, uh, 
reason to change the date. If, if nobody's wanting to attend Roma, then that kind of answers it. Correct? Okay. So, um, Mark. There he is. I wasn't sure if Fred was done there or not. Um, so I had Roma on my list. Uh, just one one uh, situation that's come up here. Uh, I had a list of stuff, but it's mostly just updates. I, but the one I, I would like an answer from council if possible is uh, with the um, with the change in the court system, uh, we're, we're kind of at, a, a, at a, a loss to being able to collect our fire calls right now. I know council's direction was to provide everybody with the opportunity to have their day in court before we collect. Uh, but we do have, uh, we, we have got a couple of, uh, I call them egregious calls, burning without permits and then burning again without a permit that I think that uh, there is a need to uh, deal with some of these issues. So I'm wondering until the, the, the uh, courts get back open and flowing again, whether there would be any re resistance to uh, staff uh, moving back to the process we used to use in billing out our fire calls, at least until this is, uh, um, at least we have a better defined idea of when we're gonna get back in the courts properly. I'd, I'd go for it. Yeah, I, I, I would wonder whether or not, is there any uh, disadvantage to not doing that uh, in terms of lapse of time? Like if, if in other words, we're, we're billing and then we can follow up with, you haven't paid your bill yet, and then eventually we're gonna have to take you to court to get the money. Get the paperwork out and flowing, yeah. Right. Uh, John? I, don't know. I think, Police services are going to be facing the same issue with some of their false alarm calls as well. John, I, I guess I guess there's no harm in in um, billing with a very short time frame, with the understanding that if payment is not made, that we we swear a, a, an information and uh, put it put the matter before the courts at the very least. And um, you know, do it do it in that order. Now it's going to take a long time for it to work through the courts, um, and there may be some issues with regard to that. But uh, uh, I can understand why we would we would revert. Um, in principle, I don't like it, but uh, I can see that we may have to do it. Okay. All right. So nobody seems to have an issue with that, Mark. So you want to continue? Uh, no, that I, for the sake of the, the evening, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> for the sake of the evening. So, John, do you have anything to report? Yes, uh, very briefly. Um, Thursday is the day scheduled for the installation of uh, internet to antenna on top of the water tower. Uh, it's been quite a, an interesting experience, a lot of moving parts, a lot of... Uh, of situations where um, everybody has been dependent on uh, Bell's arrival and um, Matt's done a, an outstanding job uh, in terms of accommodation of various things. The Orangeville water people have been great, but uh, Thursday's the day that uh, the, the tower is climbed and the equipment is installed and hopefully turned on. Um, I just wanted to make two, two comments about uh, the um, town hall meeting. Number one is if if we do one again, and I certainly hope we do, I think we need to give serious consideration to the format. Um, my preference, frankly, would be that uh, we have uh, sufficient time for residents to suggest topics to us, uh, that we move away from the presenter uh, format to one of uh, uh, free-flowing discussion between ourselves and residents. Uh, on topics that are chosen by residents. Um, I was not happy camper by the end of that meeting, I will tell you. Um, I was not happy at all. Um, the other thing that arose from that meeting, and I just need some clarification on it, is I got the sense from Fred's presentation on the plastics bylaw that we were also prohibiting 
recyclable paper bags, uh, at least large ones. Uh, mindful of the the exemption for small ones for things like nuts and bolts at the hardware store. Um, I don't think it was ever my intention uh, that a business couldn't use a recyclable uh, brown paper bag. But the way the bylaw was described to us, I got the distinct impression that uh, you couldn't. Fred, did and you if want that's to the case, I think we need to revisit the wording of the bylaw. So the bylaw states that if a business is going to give out a checkout bag, that it must be a paper bag, it must be capable of being recycled, and it has to be charged to the customer. Okay, that, so that, did, the only that difference. was not terribly clear uh, to me. Um, and I guess if, 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 if that was a little bit clearer, because we have um, a bylaw that has a particular name having to do with the function, but then we've always referred to it colloquially as the plastic bag bylaw, when in fact it really is a bylaw that governs the kind of, of, uh, of um, container, as it were, that the, 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 that the business hands out. Um, I, I, well, I, I, guess, I, I would invite everybody to go back and look at the wording of the bylaw because it's not, to, to my reading, it's not that clear that the paper bag is a very clear option. Okay, Fred, next. We do call it the plastic by, bylaw. In fact, the, the operative word is checkout bag. That, that's, that's what we are prohibiting checkout bags and then it defines that, that them okay and in that definition are included large paper bags uh, unless they can be reused a hundred times so so it, maybe we shouldn't call it the plastic bylaw we should call it the checkout bag by, by law that's really what it's about and, and I must admit too John that some of that detail between when we originally passed it and, and the presentation that Fred Simpson made it. I'd sort of forgotten about that, but, but that that's that's what the bylaw is. It's a bylaw about checkout bags. And that's how it's titled. Okay. Uh, Ralph? I read the bylaw again after Fred's presentation because I uh, maybe I wasn't listening carefully, but I was having some trouble with the getting it getting it um, when I went back and read the bylaw I think it it could be wordsmith to make it clearer about what we're talking about with respect to plastic and, and paper bags when it goes to the section on small paper bags it suggest it suggests that maybe large paper bags are, are are not acceptable when they really are quite clearly acceptable so I'm not quite sure the mechanism of this your honor but I think it, um, it just uh, this bylaw Need to be reworded so it's like a clarity. Okay. Anything else, John? No, that's it. Okay. Uh, Ralph. Um. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Fred. So, so, do you want this bylaw to come back to council for further reconsideration? Keeping in mind that if we amend the bylaw. We'll have to uh, also resubmit it for uh, the set fine. Is what, oh no, sorry, this bylaw doesn't have a set fine. So that doesn't apply. So it doesn't apply. Uh, so I think it's got a, the way it is so, now, Fred. It has, it's a problem in, in, in an understanding. So I'm not sure what the mechanism is, but um, maybe be a pretty business without having to be resubmit. So. So maybe, I think what Ralph is trying to say is that, uh, is there a way that we can wordsmith without having to resubmit or recirculate, et cetera, et cetera, so it is clear? Like adding explanation in brackets? <laughs> yes, John. I, I think what Ralph was saying was quite correct in as much as by exempting the small paper bag 
the inference is that the large paper bag is not an exception either. Um, and I think we have to make it plainer that a paper bag is an acceptable uh, c container, as it were. Um, and I, I don't see, even if you had to resubmit it to the to the uh, regional senior judge, I don't see that as being a, a particularly on onerous thing, especially when it's a clarification as opposed to a fundamental change. So I'm not quite clear on what the change is that council wants. So the way it's currently written, it uh, the only type of checkout bag that can be offered to a customer is a paper bag that is recyclable, discounting the number of exceptions that there are for certain uh, products that are being purchased. Uh, so are you looking for that to no longer be a recycled paper bag, but any type of paper bag? Is that what council is looking for? Fred, next. I, I think uh, if I'm hearing John right, the answer could very simply be to go to the definition section clause C and take out the word paper bag. Then in effect, we'd be defining checkout bags as plastic bags. But I, th I think that's right. And, and Fred, you're quite right. You're, you, you, the way you describe it is understandable, but uh, I, I haven't read it for a couple of days, but when I read it, it was a, it was a bit confusing to me. I thought it was ambiguous. Um, you can fix it. <laughs> Fred, Fred. <laughs> I'm, I'm still just not, and maybe, maybe I'm just missing the point, but I'm not clear what council's looking for. If you're looking for this uh, to be such that a checkout bag can be any type of paper bag, then I can make that change. It'll be two changes. The definition of a checkout bag will no longer include paper. And the type of bag that can be given out by a retailer will be a paper bag as opposed to a recyclable paper bag. Uh, the customer must still be asked and confirm they want it and they must still be charged. So we're just taking out that requirement that the paper bag used as a checkout bag must be recyclable. And if that's what you're looking for, absolutely, I can make those changes. I think that's what I'm looking for. And, and the this is really about plastic checkout bags. That's what the that's what the, the heading should be. I think the plastic checkout bags. That's where our problem is. Okay. So, if you want to uh, bring that back at your convenience to uh, with whatever changes that you've made for clarity, and we can give it the nod. Okay, so uh, Ralph, do you have anything? Uh, just briefly, the Polnir Garden took advantage of the uh, great weather we had the last five or six days, and we decided to uh, finish off the south lot. Uh, so this involved the uh, work party on uh, Thursday, on Friday, on Sunday, and on Monday, uh, all of which I dutifully attended, and I was exhausted afterwards. Anyway, uh, we have. Uh, we prepared to move some uh, mound around and restructured a, 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 a firm that we have there. Uh, we prepared the ground and we seeded half of it. So we had another half the seed would be done. Well, we have to really hand it to the um, people who, who came out. Many of them came out more than one time and uh, worked uh, worked quite hard. So it was very, very satisfying. With respect to John's comments about the, uh, um, the town hall, I believe it's worth us uh, having a, a discussion uh, about what we'd like to see at the town hall because I was disappointed in the last one and not the least of it was, was uh, the lack of attendance uh, and uh, and the second was the, the actual, you know, it, it, I don't know, we probably all have different ideas of what a town hall should be, but that wasn't, wasn't uh, didn't fulfill my idea, which is more of a, a discussion activity. Uh, and of course, if we did. We only had four people there on on on, on uh, 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 joining. Them, but we really couldn't have much discussion. So somehow or other, we have to um, get the word out, and maybe word, maybe people aren't interested in a virtual town hall. 
but they certainly uh, were interested to a modest degree in the in the ones that were we've had previously, and um, so I think the interest interest is there. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to discuss it further rather than at, at uh, twenty to eleven. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that, but yes, we do need to discuss it further. It was it was very disappointing after all the planning that staff had to do and the advertisements, etc. And it was very clear when uh, we started this is that we knew it was going to be different because it, it doesn't have that same uh, connection with people in front of you having that uh, ability to show emotions and and acknowledge etc cetera, etc cetera. so this this whole form of communication right now is very disenfranchising people um, and I know I just heard on the radio today they said as soon as this is over the first thing I'm going to do is stop doing zoom meetings because they're just <laughs> hating it so much so that's the only thing that people are doing to communicate and and uh, but I, I think we, we just need to be aware of, of the problems that existed with that meeting and be aware that uh, there is expectation from our residents and we need to come up with some, uh, do you have anything? Sharon, do you have anything? Um, just quickly, I, I had the opportunity to be in the, in uh, Menorah Park, lower parking lot and I have to tell you there are hundreds of people using that park hundreds daily the traffic was uh, quite incredible I, I couldn't get over the number of people I'd like to have a counter down there to make to see what's going on on the weekends I know it was a beautiful absolutely gorgeous day so maybe there were more people out uh, than usual, but it was fantastic. I counted nine dogs in like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> people with them. Yeah, oh, yes, for sure. Okay, so um, are there any notices of motion this evening? And not hearing anything, so if there's no further business, Oh, Mr. Early. Uh, sorry, just following up on an earlier conversation. Uh, you repealed your litter bylaw, which was the garbage bylaw in 82-16 uh, when you approved the community standards bylaw, but the community standards bylaw covers litter quite well and it includes placing litter either on private property or on public property, including roadways. Okay, so it does exist. We just need to uh, enforce it. Okay, so yes, I, I'm just about to close off. Would you like to uh, move the motion that we introduce and give the necessary readings to a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Town of Walden in session VC 15-2020 held on the 10th of November 2020, that it be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed and grossed in the bylaw book. Moved by Nix and seconded by Martin. And any discussion? And seeing none, anybody opposed? That's carried. And we adjourn at 10.42 p.m. And that's moved by Krillman and seconded by Mangtelo. And nobody's opposed, so that's carried. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you next Tuesday for sure, if not before.